Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you from all over the world to this uh, webinar on online courts perspectives from the bench and bar. Uh, my name is uh, Professor David Wilkins. I'm a professor here at Harvard Law School and the director on the Center on the Legal Profession. Uh, and we are thrilled that we will be joined by over 1,000 people from around the globe to talk about this critically important topic. Uh, the Center on the Legal Profession uh, is a research institution here at Harvard Law School, where I'm based, and we're really dedicated to three broad missions. One is to conduct world-class empirical research on the important issues facing the legal profession. The second is to help to rethink how to teach law students and practitioners uh, in a more innovative way. But the most important mission is to bridge what sometimes is the far too great gap between theory and practice or between practitioners and academics and members of the bench and bar uh, to talk about the critical issues facing our profession. This webinar comes out of that mission. And it started actually uh, several months ago uh, when my dear friend Richard Suskin, who I will introduce in a moment, uh, told me that he had written an important and largely at the time theoretical book around online courts and the future of justice. Uh, we said, we'd love to do a, a book launch for you and we were going to arrange for him to come to Harvard. Well, the world changed between January when we first had that discussion and the book was published and uh, April when the event was set for and it became a virtual event. Uh, but that event drew again, over a thousand people from all over the world uh, in which Richard presented his ideas which were no longer theoretical uh, and we had commentary from uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, Ralph Gantz, uh, who gave a wonderful reflections on, as a, as a judge, about how he thought about the developments Richard was talking about. Since that date, so much has happened and so many courts around the world have closed and so many proceedings have moved online. And Richard very generously agreed to update the thinking of his book in an important article which he published in our digital magazine, which we call The Practice uh, in July. And we said to Richard, we would love to have an opportunity to reconvene uh, this group of thought leaders and others who will join us to think about what the implications of your new thinking about online courts are. And that's what brings us here today. Uh, as you can see from the program, we have an incredible array of speakers, uh, beginning with Richard, who will kick us off with some reflections. Uh, then we will have a panel of incredible lawyers who are actively engaged in the process of navigating online courts, who I will introduce uh, when we begin that at 1030. Uh, then we are uh, will have a tribute to Justice Gantz, who sadly died earlier this fall, including a lecture by uh, Harold Coe, who is a mutual and dear friend. Then we will have a keynote address, which we are deeply honored uh, by Chancellor Voss, uh, as well as reflections by other leading judges and lawyers around the world. And then we'll end with next steps. Throughout this time, we will try to incorporate your voice as best we can. So please go to the Q&A function on the webinar and put in your questions. We have someone monitoring them and there'll be a lot of people and a lot of questions. So we certainly can't promise to get to everyone, but we will try to get to as many as we can or incorporate your thoughts and ideas into the dialogue. So, uh, this is really a, a deep honor for me uh, to be able to begin this 
discussion by turning to my friend Richard Susskind. Uh, he's a man who has many titles, who has done many things. Uh, I We've been friends for now, I think Richard, almost 15 years, maybe closer to 20 since he first began writing books about the future of the legal profession. Uh, he has become uh, an important voice on so many issues, roughly speaking at the intersection of technology and law. And perhaps for this purpose, most importantly, since uh, I think he said 1998, he's been the technology advisor to the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales on this issue. So Richard will begin our discussion by giving us his reflections on what's happening with online courts today. Richard. David, can I just check that you can see my slides and hear my voice? Thank you very much and good day to everyone. Uh, David, it's always such a pleasure to collaborate with you. Thank you to you and your team for once again convening an event that brings interested parties from around the world together. And what a time we've had since we last convened to discuss this subject. I've got 20 minutes, as you see before you, to summarize what the future of courts might look like. And I thought I'd do that under four headings. I want to talk about the challenges that currently face us, the mindset that we should have in thinking about the future, the progress we've made, and what the future might look like. So let's start with the challenges. The reality is, and it's a harsh reality, that around the world, to varying degrees, many hearing rooms have closed. And as COVID right around our world brings both illness and poor health, it also is bringing large backlogs to our court systems. So it's had direct effect on access to justice. But even before COVID came, we had a problem. And I phrase it like this, that even in the most advanced legal systems, most civil disputes, for example, cost too much, they take too long, the process is excessively combative, it's also unintelligible, unless one's a lawyer, and is surely out of step in a digital society. This is my attempt to capture the access to justice problem. To make it more concrete, we see in some jurisdictions some staggering backlogs. 80 million cases in the courts of Brazil, 30 million in India. And I think worse still, the statistics according to the OECD, that only 46% of human beings live under the protection of the law. For all of us as lawyers, this is something I believe we should be collectively ashamed of. We have to do a better job. Our courts are not serving the people who frankly very often need the help and they simply cannot afford that assistance today. So we have a grave problem and I think we need a new mindset to sort out this problem. Let me take you to a meeting that I attended and spoke at not far from where David is today in Boston in late 2017 when I was asked to address a group of neurosurgeons, 2,000 neurosurgeons, further to a book I'd written called The Future of the Profession that I co-authored with my son, Daniel. Hey, uh, Richard, they asked me to be uh, controversial. Richard, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think what we're seeing on the screen is your presenter mode. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. Full screen mode, that way people, I think it'll be easier for people to see the slides. And I see, I'll see you back here 30 seconds. It'll take you to do that. Okay. Perfect. How's that looking? Perfect. I won't offer to start again. <laughs> but let me take you again to Boston, to that conference when I was asked to speak to 2,000 neurosurgeons about the future of professional services. And at that event, they asked me to be controversial. So I said to them, patients don't want neurosurgeons. Gasp an audience. I said, patients want health. I said, for a particular type of health problem, I have no doubt you're the best answer we have today. But looking forward, perhaps 70 years from now, we'll perhaps think, in, in retrospect, or others will, isn't it amazing that we used to cut bodies open, how crude that was? Because I said the future of surgery is perhaps not robotic surgery, as they thought I'd be speaking on, but no surgery at all, because the future of healthcare is non-invasive treatment. And this led me to think that quite often when we ask about the future of courts, we're asking the wrong question. We shouldn't be asking 
what's the future of courts or what's the future of neurosurgery, we should be asking how in the future will we be solving the problems to which neurosurgery or courts, as the case may be, might be our best answer. So we have ways of working today, but we shouldn't think that tomorrow will necessarily be a cheaper, quicker, better version of what we have today. And there's another way of putting this, that in terms of technology, we tend to fixate on automation. The first 60 years of legal and court technology has been devoted to automation. The use of technology to streamline, to optimize, to improve, to enhance our traditional ways of working. What I'm more interested in is transformation. The use of technology fundamentally to change how we work, often to allow us to do things in entirely new ways. Simply streamlining and improving through automation gives us too often mess for less. What we want through transformation is a greatly improved service that allows far wider access, the far wider access that I believe many people are denied today. So this combination of what I call outcome thinking, think that we want, that patients want health rather than doctors, and this notion that what we should be looking at as transformation rather than automation leads me, and this is the final mindset observation, to ask this very simple question, is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to assemble in one place to resolve our differences or might be the new and different ways of re resolving our disputes? So what progress have we made towards the notion of court being a place, a service rather than a place? Well, as David noted in mid-March and from then on, courts around the world have closed. And what sprung up, and I use this term very generically, have what we call remote courts. And remote courts is the term we certainly use in the UK to cover three different possibilities. Now, remote courts worldwide, the address for that is remotecourts.org, is a service that I've been involved in putting together, which tracks and records the progress that many countries, jurisdictions are making in moving their courts from physical courtrooms to remote courts during the crisis. And there's three types of remote court that have emerged. The audio hearing, the video hearing, and the paper hearing. The audio hearing, as one might expect, essentially a hearing by telephone conference call. The video hearing, using technologies much like the technology we have just now, is a hearing by video. And thirdly, there's the paper hearing, which is not really a hearing at all. That's when um, the evidence and arguments are submitted in electronic form to judges and there's some kind of online argument, but it's more in the manner of an exchange of emails and the judge responds with their determination in the same way. There's no oral evidence, there's no physical hearing. These are the three options we have under the heading of remote hearings. These are the three alternatives to the physical court hearing. The audio and video, video remember, come also in two sorts. One is where it's a full audio and video hearing where everyone is participating in the same way. And the second is a partial or maybe sometimes called a hybrid hearing where some people are in a physical courtroom and others are connected in by audio or video. But they are the range of options we have to, today. And in relation to that, I want to make four observations, uh, four conclusions really that I draw from the experience of the last six months. The first is that overwhelmingly, I think the preferred form of remote hearing has been the video hearing. And the reality is the video hearings work fairly well. I think if you've asked most judges and lawyers in say January, what they thought of video hearings, they would have expressed an instinctive, a visceral, uh, but rather negative view of their potential. They'd have drawn attention to all sorts of limitations, but all the experience, and in fact, the serious empirical studies, for example, by the Civil Justice Council in England and Wales, suggest a fairly high level of satisfaction amongst judges and lawyers who are using video hearings. So that's a first conclusion. A second conclusion that interests me is that judges and lawyers can adapt quite quickly. It's commonly said, and I think it remains true, that judges and lawyers are fairly conservative. Indeed, in the book that I wrote with my son, when we looked across many professions, uh, other than the clergy, judges and lawyers seem to be the most conservative at all. But isn't it fascinating in this time of great pressure, when judges and lawyers really needed to, how quickly they adapted? how quickly they change, the speed with which new protocols come out, the familiarity with which very quickly lawyers and judges had with the new enabling technology. And I think there's a major lesson for us there. When judges and lawyers need to change, they can indeed. And that's my second observation. The third observation is that 
during this period, minds have been opened and indeed some minds have been changed. Many people who wouldn't have dreamt of using video hearings in January now find it second nature. And many other people are of the view, we will never go back. This is the start of a long journey towards transformation in the justice system. And the fourth conclusion I want to draw is that I think COVID-19 has, has both accelerated and decelerated technological change. There is a common, but I think slightly simplistic view that it's accelerated everything. Uh, my son Daniel and I produced in, towards the end of March, uh, a little model that explained how it was we thought or the five stages of recovery that the profession would go through in, in moving through COVID. The first was mobilization, essentially setting up remote working. The second was lockdown, self-evident. The third, emergence, which is really where we find ourselves today to varying degrees coming out of uh, COVID, but still sometimes looping back around as we sadly are in England uh, to lockdown. But when the vaccines are put in place, or when there's far more effective treatment or far better testing, we can imagine the economy being turned on, a great surge of activity, and in due course, a new equilibrium will be established. But when you look at that diagram, and here what I've tried to map is the, the red line refers to automation and the blue line refers to transformation. We've seen a great leap in automation, the use of technologies to help us communicate and collaborate and cooperate more effectively, great investment there, but many of the transformative technologies have actually been put on back burner. Now, I think I'm often, uh, and this has happened since the last lecture, people say to me, Richard, the future you depict has arrived, job done as it were, uh, um, what you've said about the future has now come to pass. Uh, I, I don't think the future hasn't ar has arrived yet. I don't think home working is a full transformation. I don't think dropping hearings into Zoom is, is a shift in paradigm, as many would want us to believe, because the reality is the people involved, the rules involved, the processes and the problems remain much the same. We still have the access to justice problem, whether or not we're actually hearing cases by video. So COVID-19, I think, is best regarded as an experiment. It's an experiment during which we need to gather data about what works well, what doesn't work well, and what works well, we should certainly industrialize. Uh, and COVID-19 offers a springboard, I have no doubt, into a new world. There are, by the way, some hints of a new orthodoxy emerging. We might see some of this today, where people believe now the only remote alternative is the, is the video hearing room. It's now become the new comfort zone of many judges and lawyers. But my message today to you folks is that we're just at the foothills. Uh, I believe what we've seen here, and COVID's a springboard, is we've seen a glimpse of the notion that court service, indeed legal service, might be delivered in entirely new ways. So let me give you a sense of this future. To some extent, I'll be leapfrogging some of the discussion that follows, because we're going to hear from some very experienced practitioners about their direct first-hand um, daily activities uh, through video hearings. But I want to leapfrog that to some extent and take you to the future. And in a way, back to this book I wrote, and people are kind when they say I was prescient, but the reality is two things. One, of course, I had no sense that the pandemic was coming. And secondly, much of my book, although there's some on video hearings, much of my book was in fact devoted to the paper hearing, to this idea of there not being physical courtrooms or oral hearings at all. My interest was in high volumes of low value cases where people were denied access to justice, that we needed a fundamentally new way of delivering the court service. And pivotal to my view of the future is as one might expect, and as David advertised, the notion of technology. I could give you a chapter and verse about what technology is doing, how it's changing a society or an economy, but just let me summarize it in two propositions. Our systems are becoming increasingly capable. Uh, you can call it AI, you can call it blockchain, you can call it machine learning, you can refer to all sorts of enabling technologies, but the bigger point is this, that our systems are able to do more and more. Certainly pre-COVID, barely a day passed when you didn't hear news of some system or app or technological breakthrough. Often systems that were taking on tasks that historically we thought could only be taken on by human beings. So our systems are becoming increasingly capable. The pace of change is accelerating and there's no obvious finishing line. No one in China or Silicon Valley or South Korea are, uh, is dusting their hands off and saying job done. That's the technology project over. Quite the reverse, I'll say again, the pace of change is accelerating. And that leads me to think that there are going to be five main features 
of the court system of the future over and above, this isn't replacing, but it's over and above the physical hearing room, which will of course be used in many cases, the video hearing room, which already we've seen uh, uh, successfully in action. But I think we've got to look further to five phenomena, the asynchronous online judging process, I'm going to explain each of these terms, extended court services, as I call them, front ends, artificial intelligence and dispute avoidance. So let me say just a, a couple of minutes on each. The idea of the asynchronous hearing, it's a funny old term, asynchronous and synchronous, it's from communication theory. Synchronous communication is when the people communicating need to be available at the same time. When you have a phone call, when you have a meeting, when you have a video conference, that synchronous process, you need to be available at the same time. Asynchronous is when you don't. The text message, the email, where you communicate at your own convenience. Now, I carry this idea forward in my book to the idea of online judging, and it's not an entirely new phenomenon at all. We've seen cases decided in the papers alone for many years and in many appeal courts around the world, but I want to industrialize this. So this, again, to re reiterate the notion of the paper hearing, this is the idea that evidence and arguments are submitted not orally, but in electronic form. There's some kind of online debate and discussion conducted asynchronously with judges and the parties, and therefore at their convenience from their kitchen table at whatever time of day matters to them, no time off work, no forbidding oral hearing. Remember, I'm thinking about high volumes of low value cases. That's the process of online judging. We're not talking about artificial intelligence at this stage. We're talking about human, qualified human judges working in an entirely new way. And I can take you to places around the world, most notably, I think, in the Civil Resolution Tribunal in Canada, but we've seen evidence of this in, Eng in England, in Australia, in China, United States too, where this is actually, it's early days, but it's working and the level of satisfaction from court users is very high indeed. And all of that is dealt with in, in my research. Let me turn then to the extended court service. And for many people, this is more challenging and perhaps even unconstitutional. The point I make here is that in a digital society, I think we need to do more. And in our particular digital society, we need to do more to help people who are appearing before courts, even if they appear through some asynchronous process or through some more relaxed virtual hearing. The harsh reality is there is a gulf between having access to the courts and being able to use the courts without lawyers. And so many people for many years have said, oh, the answer to the access to justice problem is to put up websites so people understand their entitlements. But I say there's a justice gulf between understanding your rights and enforcing your rights. And traditionally that gulf is bridged by lawyers. But in a world where frankly, most people can't afford lawyers, in a world where if we're realistic, public legal funding is likely to go down rather than up. We have to find radically new ways of helping people to understand their entitlements. And so what I call the extended court, and I argue in my book that this is a legitimate secondary function of the court system, the primary function being the delivery of binding authoritative decisions. A secondary function is the provision of help to help people understand their rights and entitlements, to help people understand the remedies and options available to them, to help people formulate their arguments, to help people organize their evidence, to provide online tools to help parties negotiate and be facilitated, not as a private sector alternative, but baked in the system. And that's what I call the extended court system. And that was what I call for in my book, for in my book, I define online courts, or my focus is online judging combined with extended courts. But since then, I've recognized there may be a different approach, a complementary approach. And because our court system is suffering so badly from so many back backlogs arising out of COVID, the extended court phenomenon, and I cover this as a possibility in my book, but for reasons I won't detain you with today, rejected it in the first instance, uh, but I can now see there's a private sector alternative or a non-state provided alternative to the extended courts, and I call them front ends. And in the article that David mentioned to, to you that I, I was invited to write for their online publication, uh, The Practice, I explained this in some detail. But the way to think of it is, rather than having these extended court services within 
the court system, they could hover, as it were, as a front end on top of or to the side of the court system. And these could be provided by private sector providers, they could be provided by charities, they might be provided by educational bodies. But again, these front ends would allow people to understand uh, their entitlements, to understand the options available to them, to help them marshal their arguments and organize their evidence, and to provide tools to provide essentially a form of online ADR. We often call it, call it online dispute resolution. So whether or not we see them as part of a state provided service or whether or not we pull them out as a front end that is in some way yet to be identified, some way integrated with the court service, I don't mind. But I do think that simply making dispute resolution by the state more available is only half the battle. We need to give people a lot more help. We're working in this in LawTech UK, incidentally, which is a, a body set up in the UK to help promote and encourage greater use of technology in our legal and court systems. And we have a, a project exploring precisely how this kind of front end might work in practice. Little bit artificial intelligence, very little, because I just want to plant the thought. Uh, I wrote my PhD on AI and law at Oxford in the 80s. Uh, I say this to you, that most of the short-term predictions being made about the impact of AI in the law hugely overstate its impact. However, and more importantly, most of the long-term predictions hugely understate its impact. Will AI transform the law within the next couple of years? Not a bit of it. By 2030, I think we'll see very substantial change. The 20s is the decade during which AI takes over. But what I don't want people to think, and this is a, a cartoon that was, appeared in The Economist in a review of our book, which is called Professor Dr. Robot QC. I don't want to think, or people to think, that what we have in mind here is essentially that when you come into your office one day, there's a machine, a robot sitting there, uh, having taken your place. That's about as sensible as thinking that self-driving cars are going to have robots sitting in a regular car. When one starts thinking about the outputs, the outcomes that clients actually need, that doesn't need to be delivered by a robot with arms and nostrils. Uh, the whole notion of a robot lawyer is for me misconceived. It anthropomorphizes the way we deliver services. The reality is that emerging AIs will take on many of the tasks that lawyers take on, not by copying or replicating the way we work, but by working we're really by building on their distinctive capabilities, huge processing power, massive quantities of data, very clever algorithms. But for those people who say things like a computer can't be creative, imaginative, a computer can't think, all of these things are true, but computers do not need to be creative or imaginative or capable of cognition to outperform us. We're already seeing this. The final observation is that we need, I, I think under the heading of AI, we need to distinguish between the AI providing legal help to help people understand their rights and entitlements. And the idea that I built on in my last presentation, which was we can imagine a form of determination by a state body that is based on these predictive systems that are emerging, systems that predict the outcome of cases. Finally, dispute avoidance. In the end, I've never met a client who prefer a great dispute, great big dispute, well resolved by a lawyer to not having a dispute at all. Clients want a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. And this means in the future that the whole notion of legal risk management will be as important as legal problem solving. What about justice, I hear you cry? Well, again, this is when in fact, where I come in, it's why I wrote the book in the first place. It's my preoccupation. People both invoke justice to criticize online courts as well as to support them. When I unpacked this, I identified seven different concepts of justice that we use in our discussions of online courts and of courts generally. Each of them, I think, can be applied in the context of online courts. There is a debate to be had about the extent to which online or physical courts deliver more or less access under each of these headings, but that's very much for another talk. I throw these up there in, in my conclusion, just to show that we are thinking about these issues, those of us who are thinking about technology. In the end, what we're trying to do is improve access to justice. David, back to you in our Harvard studio. Thank you. Well, as always, the, uh, the you're not actually in Oxford. I think you're in some beautiful hamlet between London and Oxford, but that studio always uh, produces terrific food for thought. And so Richard, thank you so much for those uh, engaging remarks. 
And I hope that over the course of the next few hours that we'll have an opportunity to pick up on some of those threads. Uh, but in this panel, what we wanna do is really bring in a voice that really I don't think has been brought up nearly enough and often isn't brought up nearly enough when we talk about these big transformational changes. And that is the role of lawyers who are the ones who after all uh, have to navigate these processes. Uh, and uh, the lawyers today have been thrown into a world quite frankly that none of them either expected or had time to prepare for, and yet they've had to continue uh, to represent their clients uh, in this new phase. So what we're gonna do here is we have four amazing advocates here, uh, two from the US side and two from the other side of the pond on the UK. Uh, and I, I have told them that what I want here is a conversation. So. I've got some questions and some things that I hope will help to steer the discussion, but I've encouraged each of them to please feel free uh, to jump in, to interrupt, to give their views, because I think that will give you, the audience, the best opportunity uh, to gain from their insight and experience. I also said to them, I'm only going to give them the world's briefest introduction because I could spend the entire time introducing them and all their accomplishments. Uh, so I'll just, I'm not sure what order they are on the screen for you, but I'll start with Jamie Gorelick, who's a uh, senior partner at Wilmer Hale here in the United States, living in Washington, D.C., former deputy attorney general, and again, known to many of you as one of the premier litigators uh, in the world. Uh, my dear friend, Kathleen Sullivan, uh, who uh, we taught together at Harvard Law School when she was just a mere law professor. Then she became a dean, which is even bigger at Stanford. And then she became a named partner in one of the top litigating law firms, Quinn Emanuel in the world, and one of the top uh, appellate advocates in this country. Uh, Colin Passmore, uh, who I've gotten to know uh, through our connection with the uh, Thomson Reuters Managing Partner Conference, and we've had many terrific conversations through that venue. Colin is the senior partner at Simmons & Simmons. I used to think before I studied lawyers that that mean he was the oldest partner, but no, it just means he's the senior strategy partner at Simmons & Simmons. And finally, and not at all least, because I'm so proud, uh, Leonora Sagan is a barrister at Fountainhead Chambers. Uh, I'm sorry, Fountain Chambers. I always want to put the Fountainhead on there as a UK thing, I think, or a US about a UK thing. But she was also my student at Harvard Law School uh, in the LLM program, a superstar. She's practiced both in the UK and in the US and will represent, I hope, a view about the future. Uh, that we really ought to be talking about here. But uh, I want to start with you, Colin, because part of what got us thinking about all this was when we were talking actually about my appearing at your partner retreat, which was going to be in Monte Carlo, and we'd already picked out dinner and wine, and it was just going to be fabulous, only the problem was it was in March. Uh, and as we continue to talk about what to do about that being postponed, you told me that you were engaged in a kind of new hybrid model proceeding on a very complex uh, case that you were involved in. And so I said, gee, I'd love to have you have an opportunity to talk about that experience. And it turns out this is with not just you and me, but a thousand or so of our closest friends. So Colin, will you just start and say a little bit about what the case was about, how it was organized, and what that experience was like. Well, I think the first thing, thank you, David. I think the first thing to say is uh, really echoing something that Richard said a few moments ago. I never in my worst nightmares thought that I would be involved in a remote trial. And uh, when we wind back to February and March of this year, we were heading towards trial. The start date was the 8th of June, the pandemic hit. And we weren't entirely sure at that point whether the case was going to go ahead. But we'd already had two quite lengthy adjournments. And I think the parties wanted to work together to get the case concluded, as did the judge. 
And uh, we had literally two months to prepare for this online trial. We can talk about the preparation a little bit later, but let me tell you about the trial. Um, it, it was a claim by a private equity firm against the bank. Um, the, uh, the claim was in fraudulent misrepresentation. So uh, it, it was a uh, civil fraud case, lots of serious allegations. Uh, the headline claim was for 1.5 billion pounds. Uh, there were 17, 18 factual witnesses. There were four expert witnesses. We kicked off on the 8th of June. We finished the evidence on the 9th of August. We had two, week, uh, two months off and we came back in the middle of October for uh, the oral closing submissions. And as matters stand at the moment, uh, we are waiting for judgment. And obviously you'll understand that as I am waiting for judgment, I'm not uh, going to say uh, anything about the facts or the merits or anything uh, of that sort. But the extraordinary thing that we achieved uh, was that uh, the, the judge made available the largest courtroom in our um, civil commercial courts in London. He limited us because of social distancing to five people in court at any one time on each side, excluding the judge, his clerk, uh, uh, the usher and various tech people who looked after the technology and the rest of us, um, uh, uh, about 10 lawyers plus clients, uh, even more people on each side, we all zoomed in to the case. Um, uh, and uh, if you'd said to me in March, this is what we were going to do, I would have said to you impossible. Uh, we got to June and it happened. And it worked. We got through to the end. We finished um, on the very day that we predicted we'd finish. The judge controlled the proceedings very, very tightly. There was not a single document in court. Uh, so the old days of having huge numbers of uh, f uh, files and thousands of documents, everything was done on the, 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 magnum, the magnum document facility uh, system that many of us are familiar with. And we use Zoom as the means of us coming uh, into court when we weren't um, when we weren't physically present, it was all done through a very empty London, uh, and so actually the biggest challenge we had was arranging food at lunchtime. Uh, and I would say that on the whole, this worked extremely well, far exceeded expectations. It took a lot of preparation. There was a cost to it. We can talk about that later, um, but we got through it. Now, the only reason I think why in this case a fully remote hearing would not have worked is because it was necessary to undertake what one might call vigorous cross-examination. Um, uh, some of the witnesses were in the witness box from four to six days. Others were in for only half a day. Uh, and I think the judging in common with the parties was keen, given the seriousness of the allegations and uh, given the, the, the uh, amount of... Uh, facts that were in evidence that he wanted to see the witnesses in person. There were three witnesses based overseas. Uh, they were they could not have come into the into London to give live evidence because they would have spent 14 days isolating, uh, and and that <laughs> didn't make any sense. Uh, but otherwise, the vast majority of the witnesses came into London uh, in person, uh, and only one, a very minor witness, I think. Uh, was was cross-examined over, over Zoom. So uh, for me, uh, a, a, a very big thumbs up, but the, you do need time to arrange this. You do need uh, to be ready to pay for this sort of case, the extra cost that having us all Zooming in uh, involves. But uh, um, at, at the end of the day, as a process, it worked extremely well. And thank goodness we didn't have a third adjournment. Well, thank you. That is a fascinating uh, uh, explanation or description of what's happening today. And Jamie, I wonder, have you had a similar experience or lawyers in your group, because you yourself are a fantastic trial lawyer, but you also uh, manage a very large group of lawyers. And I wonder how your experience or the experiences that you know about are similar or different to what Colin just described, because our systems are different. Mm -hmm. the, the similarities, uh, I think, uh, outweigh the, the differences. Uh, what I did was I talked to a number of people who have had different experiences in the, at Wilmerhale, in the firm, trying cases really across the country. Um, 
uh, so I have a more, I have a, I have a less uh, personalized and more uh, uh, longitudinal view here. Uh, in, the headline for me is that oral arguments are better, cross-examination is worse. It's very, very hard to control a witness on cross on, on Zoom or whatever platform you're using. So let me unpack that a little bit. First of all, I won't go into which platforms work and which ones don't, uh, but there are real differences among, among mm. the platforms. Uh, second, uh, it is in many ways easier to adjust to what happens, quote unquote, in court. So, uh, you know, we had an oral argument before a uh, district court judge. Uh, you, we could pass notes between each ourselves, we among ourselves, we could uh, uh, get up on our screens, uh, case uh, citations and, and, and documents. All of that would have been awkward and even maybe impossible in, in a physical courtroom, much easier uh, and much more comfortable in a, in a, in a <clears throat> virtual setting. So that is very good. The, the lower level of formality, uh, you know, I'm very comfortable here in my study. Uh, it, I think allows you to to focus on the on the work. Uh, although there have been some, uh, let's just say, too informal approaches to uh, 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 being in a courtroom that's really your house. Uh, people say some uh, in say things uh, because they're not in the formal setting of a courtroom, which they need to watch out for. Obviously, um, remote proceedings are safer. I have a lot of friends who are judges and particularly district court judges who have talked about the difficulty of trials uh, when a juror gets sick, a witness gets sick, infects everybody or threatens to infect everybody. Uh, this is highly anxiety provoking. So in the current atmosphere, except for cases like cases under the Speedy Trial Act, a lot of judges are, are really leaning uh, away from being there in person. Let me turn for a minute to cross. Uh, it is harder to do cross. I mean, the, uh, my colleagues are unanimous uh, that not being in the same room as the witness has just made it way more difficult. Uh, witnesses in their homes or even in conference rooms themselves don't have the same uh, level of formality as when they're on the witness stand. Uh, they are much more likely to stray away from the questions. Um, and it's really harder to interrupt and to, and to, and to control them. Uh, and judges really have to adjust to this. Um, and not all of them uh, have one uh, expert witness told us that uh, he prefers to testify remotely because he can filibuster uh, on cross and not give the examining uh, attorney a chance to interrupt him on video. Also, it's more difficult to read a witness's nonverbal uh, cues when you're examining uh, virtually. It also presents logistical challenges because you, some courts have said, we want, I want, I, the judge, want a binder of, uh, of all of anything that you're going to use to examine a witness well before the trial. And that means that if a witness says something that, that uh, as to which you want to use a document to impeach, you know, that document may not be in the binder. And we had a judge who said, no, you can't, you can't use that document, which no, never would have happened in mm -hmm. a, in an actual, in an actual uh, uh, courtroom. Um, also, and I'm curious uh, about what uh, uh, Colin said about this, it does take longer for a virtual cross, but we end up in most of our courts with time limits on the whole case. So if it takes longer, you're eating into your own, your own, uh, your own time. Mm -hmm. um, the, I want to say one word just about technical glitches. Uh, all of us have experienced technical glitches, uh, but we had a, uh, an in-person uh, uh, bench trial uh, uh, where our side had an expert who was zooming in from Europe because he couldn't 
travel to Texas due to the pandemic. So he had to testify mm -hmm. remotely, but the delays in the video and audio transmission, the stopping and starting of the proceedings, the need to get IT staff, it just didn't, that sort of hybrid really didn't work. You had a courtroom full of people waiting for um, the technology to get uh, fixed. I think it's very important that courts uh, have uh, equal ground rules that apply to all sides. Either all the witnesses are in person or all the witnesses are remote. The bottom line of all this is that the logistical challenges really require careful planning. Uh, and we have done all kinds of things. We've had many, uh, many virtual trials uh, now over the last eight months how the witness is, is going to testify, where he or she is going to be, how the graphics get presented, what are what is the role of the technical uh, professionals? Do you have to get your documents uh, physically to uh, people? Um, uh, can you uh, fix mistakes on the on the on the fly? We are learning a lot about the the how the how the intersection of the rules of the court sets and the and the technology uh, affect the 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 outcomes. Uh, uh, so the, I'll stop there. We have lots and lots of uh, observations. I will say I really liked, uh, uh, and I'm sure Kathleen will talk about this. I really like oral argument uh, uh, online. Uh, Mm. They don't, it has advantages that uh, outweigh the disadvantages, but trials are tough. Well, that's exactly, thank you, Jamie. That was so helpful. And also the interesting, I think, contrast between the US and the UK come out there a little bit, but it was exactly where I was going to go to my friend Kathleen, one of the world's premier appellate advocates. And I wonder how this is being experienced for you. Are you doing them? And is it through Zoom or through telephone? I know in the Supreme Court, they were doing telephone arguments. So tell us a little bit about the appellate court experience. Well, thank you, David. And it's such an honor to be on this illustrious panel. Thank you for having me. I've done quite a few oral arguments now, both telephonic and by Zoom. Uh, principally in the United States Federal Circuit Courts, the Intermediate Courts of Appeal, some in District Court where I've argued a resentencing and in a criminal case and a case stated hearing, which was like an abbreviated bench trial summation. And I agree with Jamie that <clears throat> in many ways, oral argument is much more transferable to remote formats than trial is because after all, oral argument is, is a constrained, finite time period in which you have a small cast of characters assembled, usually just a few advocates and a, a small multi-member bench in our appellate courts. And it, it, it just doesn't involve the, the logistical challenges of a live trial with witnesses. So it, it ought to be transferable, but I would note two gains and two losses. Let's, let's start with the losses. And Jamie alluded to this uh, before, it's the, the loss of formality, <clears throat> or to quote from Richard's wonderful paper, majesty of the courtroom, the, the sense that you come in, you all rise for the barobed judges who sit elevated above the general audience and above the lawyers. The lawyers stand before the judges, the, the bailiff cries the court, the, there are guards at the door. There, it, it has a sense of enormous uh, seriousness and the formality and majesty gives, I think, a lot of comfort to litigants that their case is being seriously entertained. It's it's not just a day at the office. It's a major public event. That is lost. That sense that you've come to the court and, and clients often want to be at the oral argument. I often wonder why are clients so interested in the oral argument <laughs> when it often takes 10 or 15 minutes in an American court, an hour is a long argument. When we invest so many resources in preparing for oral argument, and I think the main reason is for the client, there's a dignitarian aspect to being heard in front of the decision maker face to face where you can see their body language and understand their responses to you. So that, that's gone. We have a, a, it, it's all intermediated now. We don't have that sense of formality. Whether that's important, Richard asks in his paper, is majesty a goal of the court system? Is court a place or a service? And I think that's a legitimate question, but it is a big difference. 
And the second loss is of spontaneity. In oral argument, the, the fun part of oral arguments is what I think of as jazz. It's, it's all about improvisation. It's all about doing the music you've rehearsed so well. I think uh, thinking very much of David's background here. You, you do things in an order as they come up. It's a conversation with judges where you have to improvise and respond to a spontaneous sequence of questions where there are interruptions. There are no interruptions on Zoom, or if there is an interruption, it's awkwardly overcome quickly while one judge defers to the other. And so that sense of engagement and spontaneity where you think you might change minds in the heat of the moment is gone. The gains, the two big gains are efficiency, obviously, uh, enormously efficient to be able to zoom in. Courts could theoretically have many more oral arguments per sitting uh, and, and accomplish the moving along of the caseload. I think the biggest concern in American appellate courts is the length of time from filing to disposition, which is unpredictable and varies among courts and, and takes a terribly long time with written opinions. You could theoretically have much more efficient processing of appellate matters if you use Zoom arguments because you at least decrease the wait time for argument. And I think that could be a source of future gains. And the second gain is coherence. You, what you lose in the spontaneity of argument, you gain in the kind of orderliness of the questions. Rather than jazz, we have a kind of conducted chamber music where the presiding judge does a lot of, uh, makes a lot of efforts to make sure that each judge has had his or her questions a, a chance to be answered. So yeah, and it, it, it's highly formalized at the US Supreme Court where the Chief Justice of the United States asks each justice in descending order of seniority to ask a question. And of course, famously Justice Thomas who hasn't participated in the, in the free form arguments asks excellent questions now to many and, and, and some people like that sense of orderliness that come with the questions. So I, I think appellate argument and legal argument in the district courts has adapted well to Zoom, but I think the questions to ask going forward is could the technology be used for greater efficiency? And is there a downside to not having that sense of live interaction with the decision maker, which gives authority to the judgments of the court? If, if I could just uh, comment for a moment, uh, David, you've encouraged us to do this. I have. Uh, on, on Kathleen's excellent uh, remarks. I'm not sure I can extend the uh, musical metaphor, uh, uh, so I won't try. But um, I actually have found that uh, district court judges are pretty spontaneous, and there is a back and forth. I, you know, the, the Supreme Court has there are nine of them. It's not going to work to let them uh, uh, interrupt each other the way they w did do in when they're physically present. Three uh, judges on an, uh, an appellate court uh, is somewhere in, in between. I, I don't. My feeling, Kathleen, is that um, if we keep at this, there will be a little more spontaneity than uh, than we're seeing than we saw at the beginning. I've seen it loosen up, and I've seen interruptions and interactions in a way that make me a little more optimistic about that. So Jamie, I do agree with that. Uh, my first experience, I, I gave my last live oral argument February 13th, and I had to do my first remote oral argument a, a, a few weeks later, and it was telephonic because the courts hadn't gotten up and running on Zoom or Zoom for government yet. It was awful. It was just awful. I couldn't see who I was talking to. I had studied the voices carefully, but I still wasn't always sure which judge was speaking, and I couldn't see their reactions. Zoom is immensely better because you can see their reactions. You can find an, you can see if they're smiling, if they're laughing, if they're eager to ask a question and if you've registered with them. So that's an immense gain, I agree. And I think judges are getting used to it and more comfortable with it. So uh, there, there's no reason to think that some of these old features of live oral argument can't be more and more introduced as we get more familiar with the format. Well, I think that's uh, David, could I, question. could I, David, could I just jump in um, and pick up a point that Jamie made? Um, uh, and really to echo what she said, F forgive me for interrupting, but Please, the, no, no, um, the, uh, the, the biggest challenge, it seems to me, it, with remote hearings is persuading a majority of lawyers that the cross-examination of witnesses is as effective over Zoom or whatever medium we use as opposed to in person. And I noticed uh, that one or two people have posted questions about the effectiveness 
uh, I think picking up something I said in my case, where we had three or four witnesses overseas, factual witnesses overseas, we, we were blessed in that the, um, the, the connections all worked on those days, thank goodness. Uh, and there were a few days when we lost time and the judge was very good and made it up. Um, and somebody posed the question, well, how do you know there's not someone in the room coaching them? Uh, and I'm afraid the answer to that is, you, you come down to trusting your opponents that they will do what they are supposed to do under the rules. And there was just no question in our case that uh, anyone was gonna try to bend the rules. It never, it never occurred to any of us. Um, but there is no doubt that uh, we found that the cross-examination of the live witness with the advocate, the cross-examiner, and the person being examined in front of the judge is, was so much more effective. And I, and I think that is the biggest challenge we face in terms of remote hearings. I, I totally get everything and I agree with everything that's being said about oral hearings, that's much easier. But it's the moment you have a witness and that's gonna apply, I think, to criminal trials, um, it, it, there is this sense that you need to see that person. You need to look into the whites of their eyes. I agree with that. Um, David, if I can just jump in there because I think I have a good example well, of exactly where this happened. Yeah. So the issue in my case was whether a witness to a New York arbitration who lived in England could be compelled by the English courts to give evidence in support of that New York arbitration. And in March, we took that question to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal said yes, but of course that was a few days before our first lockdown. So then we're in lockdown and we're having to examine this witness on Zoom. And the entire purpose of this examination was the credibility of this person. The question was, were they lying about what happened at this meeting some years ago? And the broad context too was, you know, the arbitration was about bribery. There were issues of credibility, of honesty, allegations of fraud. And unfortunately on this occasion, it just really didn't work. So cross-examination picking up on, on Jamie's point was really stunted. Advocates couldn't even get the tempo or the rhythm up that you can get sometimes when you're mm. in the same space mm. as a witness. There were technical glitches and loss of sound. There was the inevitable, I think, to some extent, loss of atmosphere. Mm. And I think the point that Colin was making before I agree with, you know, it's so easy to underestimate how much of the court's assessment on credibility and honesty is about mm. facial expressions. You can sometimes see the tension building up in the shoulders and in the neck. You can see the flush in the face. Mm. And a good advocate can really sort of move that momentum to their advantage. And unfortunately in this, on this occasion, it just, it, it really didn't work. But I will say one other point, uh, Colin, and this also comes back to your, your point about how do you know what's going on in the room? In our case, I think some of those issues were about a lack of standard directions. So it was just after lockdown and the court didn't, didn't have directions as to where should a witness sit? How far away from the camera should the witness be? And so odd things were happening, for example, like you know, on Zoom, it spotlights the person who's talking. But sometimes when the advocate is asking the question, you want to be looking at the witness, right? You want to be seeing what's going on in the face of the witness. And of course you can do that on some platforms, including Zoom. Mm. But those things, I think, if we get further down the line of having standard directions, because we've experienced mm. this many, many times, some of that will be improved on. But I think the central point about needing more work to be done in witness handling is, is just going to be there for the, mm. for the long term. Mm. So, so in, in, in our in our case, we we always for, so on the days when I was remote, i.e., working at home, we had three pictures always: the judge who was centre, the advocate to the right or the left, depending on how you see me, uh, and the witness in the witness box over this side. And one of the little funny side effects was when we first had these hearings, I would turn up like this, wearing a suit but with shorts underneath, which nobody could see. And none of us realized that the judge was, was going to order on day one, turn your videos off. And the moment, the moment he ordered that, all of us working at home just resorted to t-shirts and shorts and, uh, and running kit. And, and it was just left to these three people in the courtroom that, uh, as, as Kathleen was saying, to sort of project the majesty of the proceedings. 
Well, but I think that actually gets to the next point that I want to talk about, which is, so how should we be preparing for these now? Because I think most people think even after the vaccine, it's not as if this is going to go away, right? Mm. It may, it's probably not going to be as much as it is now, but I think it's very unlikely that all of the remote things we're doing in work generally are gonna go away. Mm. And that then raises the question, what do we do to prepare ourselves to do this better? And, um, you know, Jamie, you were talking about different platforms and standardization. And Leonora, you're talking about different rules about how people sit or how people are displayed. And I wonder, is that something right now, Jamie, that you're thinking about with your lawyers and love to get Kathleen and, and others in there as well? Well, we, we have real lessons learned. I mean, it, we, you know, when you have 500 litigators and you've done, I don't know how many, we've done probably 10, uh, uh, Zoom trials and then a bunch of hybrid ones, we now have lessons from this. And so we, we now know what we need to ask the judges to do. And that has a lot to do with uh, evening the playing field in ways that you wouldn't have, have contemplated before. So that's number one. I think, and this is probably a plug for Harvard Law School, we need to train the judges I mean, they, they, don't know, they don't know how to do this. And some of them are, you know, older than some of the rest of us. Uh, and so the technology is, uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work for them. I mean, it would help a lot if you didn't have to put binders physically in front of them because it actually disables you from the agility that you need in a trial. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, we need to figure out what best practices are, and we advocates are, you know, part of, uh, part of making that happen. But honestly, there have to be within the courts some sense of best practices and how you. It, it is much harder to get a fair proceeding. I mean, the, the, the these things that we've been talking about, they fall unevenly, just uh, 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 almost randomly on. On on different on different um, on on different parties and different advocates, so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I still think that if you think about lasting consequences, and and Kathleen talked about this, I think the efficiency of oral arguments uh, on uh, on in the online platforms will will be attractive to people. I mean, I'm sure that Kathleen's not the only person who's flown across the country for 15 minutes of argument. You know, that drives clients nuts. Uh, uh, and, 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 and rightly so. So it may be that we'll be in a hybrid world even when, the, the, even when uh, it is safe to come out from under the pandemic. The trial world, I'm not so sure. There may be some pieces of it. And in this interregnum, we need to work to get it right. Kathleen, any thoughts uh, from your point of view? Because I thought you really, as always, painted a very interesting tension between the efficiency argument and the ability to actually interact and persuade. And so I, I wonder how you're thinking about that. Short of, Jamie says, train the judges. I think that's a good idea, but you probably don't have the, the ability to do that at least just yet. So how, or maybe you train them through the way in which you or your lawyers interact with them. So how are you thinking about that? The preparation phase for, doing an, a, a, a virtual hearing of some kind. Well, I, I think that one of the profound lessons of this time is how collaboration among our teams is easier to practice in a remote environment. I think Jamie alluded to the idea before that the team could communicate in a trial setting among itself while the hearing was taking place remotely. And that's also true in oral argument. I was able to communicate with my team during the argument by the discreet use of email off screen. And in fact, this was extremely important in the sentencing hearing where I was remote to the courtroom, but one of my colleagues was in the courtroom with the client. And my colleague in the courtroom was able to tell me the judge is not taking notes now. You don't need to rebut that point <laughs> or you know, we're done with that point. And, and that sort of uh, communication, I think that could be systematized. My colleagues who've conducted now virtual 
bench trials, a number of virtual bench trials among the first in the Delaware Chancery Court, which involved enormous numbers of documents. I think the teams have gotten very systematic about how to collaborate during a live event by efficient sharing of documents and preparation to share documents. So I think the training, we, we have to just accelerate uh, an advance toward technological cooperation among lawyers in, in ways of presentation. And, and this can actually, I think, have a great structural effect of elevating the importance of junior members of the team. You know, the, the standard practice in oral argument is a senior lawyer gets up and gets to be the face of what is usually an enormous team effort. But now in real time, the team has more importance in conveying the ideas. And I think that can advance the careers of young lawyers more quickly as they become more integral parts of presentations during remote arguments. So also, they know how to use the technology better. When you want something done right technologically, you have to look to the younger lawyers. Yes, this is why ah. my Zoom studio was set up by my son. So, uh, but Leonora, I think that's your cue uh, to tell us kind of, you know, as part of the generation that my colleague, John Palfrey, who now runs the MacArthur Genius Foundation called Born Digital. Uh, how is it, what are the, advantages we should be moving towards. That is Richard, I think in his talk, and one of the things I always love about Richard, is he's always looking out over the horizon and asking us to think about how do we move to a world in which we're not just trying to replicate what we already do in person online, but taking advantage of that. And are there opportunities that you see uh, either that you have been able to do or that you can see being able to do uh, in this new world? Yeah, I mean, so there are two separate points, David. I think um, just briefly on challenges and then I promise to be optimistic. <laughs> the point Kathleen was making about junior lawyers, I think does cut both ways, right? Because all of a sudden overnight, when you only have one advocate being spotlit, the team sometimes becomes invisible quite literally, the junior lawyer who would have been physically present with you in the courtroom and the bench can mm. see and the client can see has become invisible. So we have to become more creative about the ways that we become visible and the ways also that we network because outside of just the hearing for junior lawyers, that challenge of building rapport of building long lasting connections has, has gone really. You don't have the walk to court with your leader. You don't mm. have the lunchtime chat with a solicitor. You don't have the client meetings. And that can be very difficult when you're actually trying to build the career. How do you get rapport? How without a physical presence do you build that community of lawyers who's going to be your support network? But you know, on opportunity- just, just, Leonora, I'll just say that point is so critical. And I bet Colin and everybody and Kathleen and, and uh, Jamie will say, the biggest challenge I think we're gonna face is how to junior lawyers build senses of community. And that's particularly mm -hmm. true for junior lawyers who are from diverse backgrounds, you know, mm -hmm. women, people mm -hmm. of color who already have challenges building informal networks and relationships mm -hmm. and being visible and all of that. So I'm very, glad you raised this issue because I think this is one that often we forget in the drive to efficiency and oh everybody could be at home so it's a really critical point but please go ahead now you're going to be optimistic you so on, on optimism I think you know I tend to side with Richard that um, the greatest opportunity here is about access to justice and at least in the UK, what I've noticed is that in the criminal sphere, there are some real opportunities here. And I know crime is a little bit beyond the sort of remit of the talk and, and also um, Richard's book. But when we're talking about access to a system that's you know, intelligible and affordable and accessible um, and where the stakes are loss of liberty, I think we can really start being super creative about where we take this in the future. So to give you a, a, a small example, um, at the moment I'm representing a defendant in a market abuse prosecution. And only because of the pandemic, all of the remote, all of the preliminary hearings have taken place remotely. But the absolute assumption in the UK courts is that even preliminary hearings in the criminal sphere will take place in person. Now that strikes me as to some extent, a lack of imagination. In this case, we have three defendants, eight counsel living quite far apart. 
and many, many preliminary hearings, some of which take 10 minutes. So you turn up to court having traveled three and a half hours on a train as a defendant, you're already nervous, potentially vulnerable, um, if you're a, a minor or if you are um, otherwise vulnerable mentally. And it seems to me that the biggest opportunity is that if this pandemic can shift the paradigm so that at the very least, just the assumptions we make as to what hearings can take place remotely and which need to be in person, will actually be doing um, quite a bit better than we have been. And I'm not gonna touch virtual juries because that's a whole nother debate. Well, <laughs> and... that's where I had to go. And I was gonna just about <laughs> ask Amy this because of course in our system, that's not just a criminal matter. And mm. you know, actually, uh, unfortunately she could not be here for this conference, but one of our former students, very proud of, just did the first virtual jury trial in Texas. And she's actually gonna come to my class on this subject at a little, uh, next week. But that is the issue that is now being put on the table. And I wonder, Jamie, how you think about that as a trial lawyer of both civil and criminal cases. I think it's really hard. And of course, this would, uh, these changes would require legislation. We have our criminal defendants have a right to be uh, present. Uh, and then they, of course, we also have the Speedy Trial Act. So we have uh, lots of imperatives in our uh, in our in our statutes that would impede uh, uh, movements in those directions. I think we need to power through the pandemic and then get the highest priority cases back into courtrooms, which are set up for them. I do. I would like to comment on Leonora's comment about the inclusion of younger lawyers. So number one, it's my experience that you can have quite a few people on Zoom uh, in, a, uh, in a hearing or uh, at a trial. And so you could actually have maybe more people present for what would be a 15 minute argument or a three week trial than you might uh, otherwise have. They can't, they can't go out for a drink after, after a hard day, but they can at least participate. Second, um, the pandemic has has engendered a great deal of ingenuity among the younger uh, lawyers and professionals. We had a an in person trial in the Eastern District of Texas in August, which is, I won't say anything more about that. And our paralegal team uh, uh, hired a huge wedding venue for our war room. It was a like a a big barn. It was called we called it the war barn instead of the war room. And it, and it allowed our people all to be in the same place, but you know, socially distanced with a lot of outdoor space to have, to have meetings. So I think um, this pandemic is triggering a lot of ingenuity about how to keep uh, a sense of uh, the team uh, uh, and how to get the teams to work together and how to make sure that all parts of the team are, are working together. So Colin, I wonder what you think about that, both how you manage that, because it sounded to me like this was a multiple defendant thing in which there were different lawyers representing different parties in different places. And then of course you yourself must have had a very large team maybe spread across multiple jurisdictions. So how did you kind of manage that? And where do you see the opportunities? Again, what, what kinds of things do you see moving forward that you can learn from this experience that actually might even be there, even if you could be all physically together? Well, I think, first of all, I agree with both Jamie and Leonora about the pluses and minuses of involving uh, younger colleagues. Um, we, we found it very easy. We, we had 30 people at any one time watching in over Zoom. What, um, but I, I do think that personal element um, is starting to come very much up the agenda. And I, I'm finding with our second UK lockdown that the, the, um, uh, the, the great goal of permanently working from home isn't going to work because you know what, we are all social creatures and we are missing being with other people. Uh, and and I, I don't think that we are all going to want to continue to do wholly remote trials. There is something about that in-person contact. Nonetheless, what we found as the positives uh, with a remote trial was, um, I think, as, as Jamie said, 
um, our colleagues sitting in their desks like this could make as much noise as they like, tapping away on the computer, finding documents, finding precedents. It was absolutely brilliant the way we were sitting in court and all this information would come pouring in. And then we also had separate WhatsApp channels. Um, you know, the advocate's got that wrong. He's on the wrong page. Don't let him make that submission. So we, we used all of that. Um, and I think that has all, all been terribly effective. Can I mention, however, one other category of person who I think sometimes gets overlooked in this, and that is the client. Yes. Um, and the client is the one paying for all of this. And we found that uh, there was a certain amount of frustration um, uh, it, with, with our hybrid setup in as, in as much as there simply wasn't room for the client in court because there were so many lawyers, there were so many facts, so many documents, albeit virtual documents. So the clients had to give their instructions over WhatsApp. And sometimes things just went slightly off the rails. Uh, not seriously, but there was a frustration. Uh, and in the end, uh, when we came back to the oral arguments, which were in person, uh, so we, so uh, Kathleen, I don't know if this will surprise you. At the end of a first instance trial, we had five full days of oral argument, mm -hmm. having been preceded by a 200 page document on either side. Uh, and um, so the clients decided that for that, although <laughs> we, we were then moved to a smaller courtroom with fewer people in it, we then hired some rooms outside. Uh, and so we'd be sitting in like this, watching in, zooming in, even though the, <laughs> the judge was literally 10 feet away in another room. Um, and, and that helped us get the clients much more closely involved. So I, I think you have to, I think we're going to have to think about all of these things, but there is no doubt, there is no doubt that remote trial working is here to stay. And when you, when you think, um, I just, just rich, one of Richard's points earlier, if you had said to me in February, I'm going to be on a zoom call with David Wilkins, don't be ridiculous. I hadn't even used business for Skype. I was still using a telephone and business for Skype. It's history, isn't it? Uh, and now we're using this wonderful technology. And I think the English courts, having started to use business for Skype, quickly came to realize, and, and certainly in our case, that just would not cope with a, a lengthy hearing. And we had to spend a little bit of time persuading the judge that all those security uh, concerns that used to exist about Zoom could be overcome, uh, had indeed been overcome. So I, I think there's, there, there's there's positives. I certainly agree with Jamie that it, it enables us to show younger lawyers examples of trial experience, what it's actually like. And, and you, you do retain a lot of, of what was there in the old days. But there is that, that sort of social connection. It, uh, we do need to think about that. And, and I worry about that generally, not just in the trial context. Uh, I, I think having, you know, the new trainee lawyers who joined my firm in August, 20 of them, um, they haven't met anyone in person. You know, that can't go on, can it? So yeah. Kathleen, that's kind of what I wanted to turn to you because you've been both a brilliant teacher, run a legal institute, uh, one of the top law schools in the world, and now are someone who really cares deeply about the training and development of young lawyers. Mm -hmm. I know that. Um, looking forward again, and, and kind of as we come towards the, end of our time here, you know, we have about a thousand people on this call who are, some are judges, some are law professors, some are litigating lawyers, some are my students, and I hope other students as we've tried to spread the word. And so as you kind of look forward from the roles you've played in this, how do you think we ought to move forward into this kind of uncertain future we're headed to? Thank you, David. And my heart went out to Leonora on her comments about young lawyers because I, and I agree with Colin very much that we're social creatures and a great deal of the teaching that I've been able to do as a practicing lawyer. And I love to teach. That's where I began my career is, is very much dependent on these live interactions, moments when you can coach a person who's practicing an argument in the room and stop them and say, do it again. Uh, and that's a little bit more difficult over Zoom. But I am optimistic that actually young lawyers can get more exposure through remote mm. technologies if we pay attention to it. First of all, 
I think the point that you can have many people on Zoom, as Jamie pointed out, is a very important one. I have often now in client meetings gone to the trouble of introducing all the young lawyers by name and describing their contributions so that the, the Zoom appearance of the person doesn't seem mysterious. And that sometimes gets overlooked in the live meeting where you get right to business. So I think, first of all, young lawyers can get a better, uh, better set of introductions to clients. Second, I think young lawyers can have more opportunities to make arguments via Zoom technology because it allows you to split up the arguments even if people are in remote locations or, or uh, uh, it, by this I don't mean a single appellate argument but where there are multiple discovery motions and pretrial uh, proceedings and that sort of thing in the American civil system that you can multiply the number of speakers readily on Zoom. And I think the third point is that young lawyers have to embrace this technology and work on presentation skills and to, uh, there are better and worse ways to do Zoom, uh, putting aside lighting, camera placement, camera setup. And I've been astonished actually in the number <laughs> of arguments I've done, how differentiated the technologies are. Sometimes, sometimes I've watched my adversaries go to great trouble to have a, an elaborate camera set up in an office, but then it's controlled by a tech and the tech and the lawyer don't necessarily communicate and the lawyer is sitting, standing at the wrong times. And the, the, it's, it, it's far better to get a command of an excellent camera setup that you can control yourself. But that's just the beginning, put aside the, the technology. What I think young lawyers have to do is embrace this as a way to develop crisp and efficient speaking styles and ways of compressing their arguments into forms that may only get a brief moment to express themselves. You know, things we do take a tremendous amount of time, too long, they go on forever. <laughs> Although I am jealous of Colin that he gets to do four day oral arguments. I'm jealous about the British system. The first time I went to the, uh, the Palace of Justice when, uh, when I was a baby law professor as a guest of a Harvard alumnus who was a distinguished Queen's counsel and he took me to court and, the oral arguments went on forever. The judges declaimed the decision from the bench. I was astonished. I said, that was amazing, that oral argument. We have to submit and we wait a long time for the opinion after a brief oral argument. And he said, yes, we in Britain have always wondered why you Yanks rely so much on the briefs and so little on the oral argument when you speak so well and write so poorly. <laughs> I begged to differ on whether we wrote poorly, but you know, I'm jealous of the, the lengthy oral arguments. But in a system where most of our oral arguments are very brief, I think this is a time for young lawyers to learn how to be extremely effective yeah. in quick sound bites and and, yep. and learn to maximize their effectiveness. So I think we can do a lot of training via Zoom. I try to spend more time with my young lawyers going over drafts and why I change things in Zoom calls than maybe I would have done live. So I hope there's some silver lining in all of that, David. Thank you. Uh, and actually, when my interviews with lawyers, many people do report that they're seeing their senior people more in part because the senior people are more cognizant about checking in. Absolutely. It's actually yeah. easier to, to do so. So yeah. I'm just going to go around the rest of you, and I'm going to start with Jamie and then Colin, and then I'm going to let Leonora speak for the future at the very end. Just any final thoughts that you might have for this amazing audience that we've put together uh, about where you think we should go and what, what can we do to learn how to embrace the best of what we have here? Well, I think we've covered a lot of that here. I think that uh, uh, online courts for oral arguments are, are here to stay. I think the days of flying across the country to do a 15 minute argument are, mm. are numbered. Um, and I think that the convenience of having input uh, while you're arguing, uh, but that's unseen by the court and anyone else is just fabulous. So uh, as Kathleen said, you have to kind of change your style a little bit, but the benefits are there. I am really dubious that we will uh, uh, embrace online trials, particularly as they require uh, uh, cross-examination. It, it, the, the downside of it is huge. Uh, in this interregnum, I think that we, anyway, within Wilmer Hale, have lots of lessons learned about how to do this and how not, what to ask the courts to do and not. Um, and we will just do the best that we can. But I, my own view, uh, 
both for the pandemic generally and for the impact on courts is to just power through this pandemic and then get to a place where we can say, what do we keep and what do we jettison? Colin? Uh, very difficult to add to that because I agree with everything that Jamie has just said. I think there is a huge saving to be had on interlocutory hearings uh, or hearings that don't require witnesses. I think a key, however, to learning the best uh, is, is ensuring or having a judiciary that embraces these changes. And at least we in the UK uh, have got a, a new master of the roles who's speaking to us later, who has given a speech in the last few days about how he's going to shake up civil justice. Uh, and I, I am pretty confident. I have no idea if he's listening, so I'm not saying this to be on his good side. Uh, even if he's not listening, um, uh, that is exactly what we need. We need the lead from the top, and I hope the top will then talk to us in the middle, and then change will start to come through, and, and thank goodness for that. And finally, Leonora, my representative of the future. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I would maybe end on an even more um, sort of radical note, taking a leaf out of Richard's book, quite literally. I really like his idea of extended courts, you know, moving beyond litigation to a, to a situation where courts can actually empower citizens to diagnose their own problems and then to use court systems to, to, to solve them. So I think on litigation, I agree with everybody else in this panel, Tr trials are gonna be difficult, appellate um, advocacy much better. But even further into the future, I think the idea of actually using the courts as systems that can help citizens solve their own problems. I'm very excited about that. So uh, I love that optimistic note. I, I'll just end by saying this before I thank this amazing panel. What I told my students on my first day of teaching this September, teaching fully remotely, actually I told them two things. One. I had never been more scared about a first day of class than when I had my actual first day of class, which Kathleen will remember in 1986. Uh, and the second thing I told them this is, I said, we're gonna kind of treat this like the advice. I don't know if any of you got, but I got when I got married. We're gonna have something old, something new, something borrowed, and we're gonna try not to be blue. So the something old is we're gonna figure out what are the best things that we used to do in person and how, what can we replicate? But we're going to try liberally to do new things online. And I do think there are a number of things that could be done. I'll just say in my class, we had, I had all my students record one to two minute videos about themselves, which we show at the beginning of every class. And I'm now quite confident we know more about my students than we ever would in an ordinary uh, classroom. We're going to borrow or more accurately steal every good idea and the rest of the world is way ahead of us in thinking about how to use digital platforms and online learning, particularly in adult context. And when you're doing an oral argument, you're teaching the judges in an online adult education format. You don't have to say that, I do. Uh, and then we're just not gonna be blue. We're just not going to see the downside of all this. We're going to try to see what can be good about it. And this panel, uh, notwithstanding pointing out the problems, just makes me more optimistic than ever that with incredible lawyers like we have here, that we're going to find ways to, to find what's best about this. I, I know I speak for everyone. If this were in a hall with a thousand people, there would be thunderous applause coming. Even if we were in a regular Zoom call, there would be lots of little yellow hands, you know, clapping like this. But you'll just have to settle for my uh, deep thanks for all of you taking time out at different times of the day, particularly my friend Kathleen, who had to get up about six o'clock in the morning to do this from California and our folks from the UK in the evening. So thank you very much. If you can stay for the rest of the event, we would love if you can. I hope we could be engaged about these arguments and issues moving forward. Any thoughts you have afterwards, please let us know. But otherwise, you know, thank you very much. Court Thank is you. over. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we're now uh, going to move to a very special part of this program. Um, and it's one that's really uh, bittersweet for me. And as I mentioned earlier, as we began, uh, 
when we had our first uh, webinar on this subject and Richard gave a brilliant address based on his book as written, uh, I, we wanted to have a judge who would uh, kind of interact with Richard and be really open uh, to the ideas, but also press hard on where the challenges were. And as I thought about the many friends, I'm very lucky that I have many friends who are judges and judges who I've had contact with at Harvard Law School. But there was one person that I knew would be perfect for this role. And that was Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. Uh, he's the Chief Justice, he was the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts uh, Court of Appeals, the highest, uh, the uh, Supreme Judicial Court, sorry, the highest court here in Massachusetts. And more importantly, a lifelong friend. Ralph and I had gone to law school together. Uh, we were on the law review together. We kind of grown up in the law and I'd seen Ralph over and over again, um, be open to new ideas, but also have really the utmost kind of wisdom about how to think about those ideas and what they, uh, really meant and how to push back on what might be the conventional wisdom, but also the new wisdom. And so we asked Ralph whether he would agree uh, to do this and he very generously said yes. And uh, he was magnificent uh, as Richard and I have spoken about since. Um, little did I know that that was the last kind of public opportunity I'd have a chance to to be with Ralph. We actually had as a follow on several uh, conversations over Zoom uh, about his efforts to think about bringing the best of the online world to the Massachusetts court system, particularly to increase access to justice, which he cared deeply about, uh, especially in the areas of landlord tenant law, where because of the pandemic and the economic crisis, so many people were facing eviction. How were they going to do that in a fair manner? But also in many other areas as well. And he had just released a major path-breaking uh, a, a report on racial justice in the Massachusetts court systems, which he had commissioned long before the current moment when such issues have become front and center in many of our consciousness. Um, and so it was just a tragedy for me uh, when Ralph had a heart attack and shortly thereafter died. And here at the Center on the Legal Profession, we have uh, had an award uh, which we call the Award for Professional Excellence. And I'm just going to give you, share my screen just for a second so I can tell you just very briefly about it. Uh, ah, there it is. See, there's an order of operations in Zoom you have to get right. And since 2015, we have been giving awards to leaders in the profession who we think uphold the highest ideals of our profession. And we do it around a theme. So you'll see uh, in 2015, we had an award, uh, a theme around women as lawyers and as leaders. And we honored some of the pioneering first women in the bar, the first president of female president of the ABA, the first general counsel of a Fortune 500 company, the first chair of a, a major law firm. We did, did one on general counsels and honored leading general counsels there, including uh, Brackett Dennison and Sabine Chalmers and Barat Bassani. Uh, we then had a fantastic program honoring black lawyers in which Ken Chenault, CEO of American Excess, Sarah Lynn Eiffel, Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Judge Williams. Uh, we did, did something on the future of work where we honored a leading tech uh, pioneer, Mark Harris from Axiom and Kim Rivera, who's the General Counsel of HP. Uh, and last year we did something on transformative lawyering where we honored Amy Weaver, the General Counsel of Salesforce and Luke Caden. It gives me great pleasure this year to bestow our award for professional excellence on Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. 
I'm not going to say much about his amazing accomplishments because my dear friend Harold Ko and his dear friend Harold Hungjao Ko is going to give a lecture in his honor in just a moment. But I'll just say this, no one exemplifies professional excellence more than Ralph. And we are so deeply honored here that his longtime life partner, Professor Deborah Ramirez from the Northeastern Law School has agreed to briefly come and, and accept this award in Ralph's behalf. So Debbie, I wish I could hand this to you. I wish I could hug you. Uh, I had a chance to honor Ralph in a wonderful ceremony we did at Harvard Law School about uh, commemorative, uh, about his life and achievements. But this is the most well-deserved honor I can imagine bestowing. So Debbie, thank you very much for being here to accept this. Thank you. Um, is it possible to see me now? Are you? I think, yes, you are being seen. Maybe if I stop sharing my screen, that'll help. Yes, oh, right. <laughs> sorry, the back end, we have a back channel too. So my terrific team is telling me what I can see and what I can't, but please. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, David, for honoring Ralph with this award for professional excellence. He would have been so proud and so pleased to receive this. Um, like many judges, when the pandemic hit, he was thrust into a turbulent sea without the skills that he would need to navigate it. I mean, if the courts are closed, then how, he thought, could they continue to administer justice? And that was a question for him and courts across the country and across the globe. He needed new skills, insights, and a way to reimagine the court system. And so the Harvard Law School Center for the Legal Profession stepped into that breach to provide United States and international judges with the advice, wisdom, experience, and tools that they would need to create virtual courts. Now, Ralph was thrilled and excited to be part of this important enterprise. And as a scholar, a judge, and the chief administrator of the Massachusetts courts, he brought real world experience into your arena. He was also profoundly and deeply grateful to Professor Richard Suskind for his guidance, advice, and scholarship. Richard, he was reading your book on the Cape just before he died. And he took it with him everywhere, to the beach, to back home, to the porch. Um, the center and Professor Suskind provided life preservers to the courts as they struggled to navigate these new and turbulent waters. And more importantly, as you've discussed this morning, the center encouraged Ralph and other judges to use technology, not just to automate what they were already doing, the existing legal processes, but to reimagine how technology might transform the court systems and improve global access to justice. For Ralph and other judges, the center provides courts with access to thought leaders, scholarship, empirical studies, and the data that can help them address the challenges they are now facing and design a blueprint for the future. He was honored to be part of that creative and important endeavor. Thank you for honoring his participation in it. And finally, he of course would have been thrilled to have his brother of choice, Harold Coe, deliver today's Ralph Gantz Memorial Lecture on the Future of the Courts. Harold was Ralph's roommate, confident, and friend. And Harold, Ralph admired your commitment to making the international court system fairer and more just. And just as importantly, he shared your passion for the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> so thank you, um, Harold, and thank you, David, um, for giving this award to Ralph. 
Thank you, Debbie. We cannot thank you enough for being here. And you also, thank you for giving Harold's introduction. I do not have to give his introduction other than to say, along with Ralph, he's one of my dearest friends of the world and one of the leading scholars in all the ways you know. But rather than hear from me about Harold, we want to hear from you, Harold. So Harold, please. <laughs> thank you so much for my technological expertise. Um, uh, when you see me touch my necktie, it's a signal to move on to the next slide. So here it is. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, I have a, a brother. Uh, I have brothers. I have a brother-in-law, but then I have brothers in the law, and they include David Wilkins, who I've known for many, many years. I have sisters in the law who include Debbie Ramirez. Um, but one of my chief brothers in the law was. Ralph Gantz. Uh, we were friends for 45 years, and um, he was really one of the people in this world I loved and admired the most. To paraphrase something I once heard him say, maybe somewhere in this world there's someone as smart and kind and admirable as Ralph, but I don't know if I've met them yet, and I don't know if I ever will. Next slide, please. Um, we were part of a very special group of friends from Harvard Law School who went on to live parallel lives, uh, Larry too, Scott Gilbert, Ralph and I, uh, they were roommates and I used to horn in and um, we've stayed together. In fact, our last Zoom call was the morning before Ralph passed away. Next slide, please. Um, as uh, Debbie said, Ralph was uh, always rooted for the underdog. This is important to the message that follows. Uh, and so we were thrilled when he became the chief of Red Sox Nation and, in fact, threw out the first pitch at Fenway Park. The last time I saw Ralph uh, was in Chicago at a friend's daughter's bat mitzvah. And we happened to go to Wrigley Field, where we saw the other great underdog team, um, the Chicago Cubs. And so we had to take this picture in front of the statue of Ernie Banks. Uh, as an intellect, Ralph was a giraffe. Um, I mean this only in a complimentary way. He was a visionary judge and lawyer. His feet were always on the ground, but his head were in the clouds because he had an extraordinary capacity to think about the present and the future at the same time. Somehow he could always look up from today's work and he had tons of work to worry about tomorrow's problems. And so he thought about access to justice, racial justice, criminal justice, and the topic of these remarks courts in the cloud. When we originally uh, scheduled this, I put the future is now question mark, but then I realized there was no need for the question mark. Richard Susskind's book is called The Future of Courts. Uh, Ralph knew the future is already here. Uh, we spent eight, nine months with online courts. So uh, because of COVID-19, um, courts in the cloud are here. Ralph saw immediately that necessity was the mother of invention. He and Judge Mark Green and just Chief Justice Kerry in a three Chief Justices letter to the Mass Bar in May said, long before the pandemic, we recognize that the civil courts will need to resolve matters without the need to come to a courthouse. By doing so, we'd enable lawyers to reduce time and cost, spare litigants from the need to miss work or find child or elder care. As always, Ralph always thinking about human needs. And then this very prophetic sentence, I know it, it just sounds like Ralph. Even when this pandemic is behind us, we don't believe we will or should go back to doing things the way we did. We will not only keep the wheels of justice spinning, but also work to create a better spinning wheel. So if we are talking about courts in the cloud, if I was talking to Ralph today, uh, what would he want and what would he value? First of all, <laughs> Ralph would wanna know what's actually going on. Um, let's not just speculate, let's hear from the front. And we just heard a wonderful panel doing so from four outstanding lawyers. How are online courts actually working? This is something that I follow in the international area, I do lots of international arbitrations and also cases before the International Court of Justice or in the domestic domain. 
Um, I've done interviews with federal and state judges, arbitrators, mediators, trial lawyers, international lawyers, arbitration counsel, both inside and outside the federal government. So what follows is a very truncated version of uh, an article that will be in the Ralph Gantz Memorial Symposium in the Boston College Law Review um, in a, a symposium that'll be held in the spring and an article that would be published in the fall. For all of you who want to know more about Ralph's amazing career, um, the, this symposium volume, uh, which has been thoroughly planned by a group of us who are working with Debbie, uh, will tell the entire story of Ralph's remarkable range of legal issues and legal commitments. Ralph's goal, as expressed in the spinning wheel letter, was civil disputes resolve equally thoughtfully but more efficiently. Obviously, efficiency savings and time cost travel, uh, environmental savings with a redu reduced carbon footprint follow from online courts. But what about equity? It's easy when all participants are sophisticated repeat technology users, but it's harder to maintain when all the participants are not. So let me start with online international adjudication at the International Court of Justice in The Hague, where I've appeared uh, on numerous occasions. Uh, in tracking there, there have been three hearings, all jurisdictional, straightforward set pieces. The bench is very passive. There's little back and forth. And so it's been a complete success. There's no um, questioning uh, and so well suited to video hearings. The real test will obviously come in merits hearings where evidence is advanced and witnesses are examined. But it's already clear that if this continues, it'll advantage repeat players at the ICJ bar and develop world counsel who have the resources and adaptability to handle such proceedings efficiently. Also in the Peace Palace at The Hague is online permanent court of arbitration, arbitration between states, state to state arbitration. Now, as you can imagine, they initially said it would be inappropriate to have video. Then the ICJ announced that they would have video. And so they finally decided quickly it was appropriate. Um, what I've heard is that after COVID, they'll likely return to in-person hearings for witness intensive hearings, but use video for procedural meetings and lower budget issues as they did not before. Um, Kathleen spoke about what she called the, the majesty effect or the formal effect. Uh, it, it's in the inter, interstate uh, setting, a gravitas effect. Uh, a lot of nation states trying to make deals like to have the formality of an in-person proceeding at the Peace Palace so that it gives a kind of imprimatur um, and globally symbolic proceedings of this kind will probably move back to in-person proceedings if given uh, the opportunity. What about online arbitration between investors and states? Just to take an example from the uh, World Bank arbitration before the ICSID, I've been advised that as one person gently put it, the pandemic has successfully forced a lot of older people to get up to speed electronically very quickly technical pre preparation and testing are key. The technology has been up to the challenge. And in fact, there's been a democratizing effect because costs have been reduced. And as said, counsel and clients can get in the room who might not be able to get into a room in a hybrid proceeding. The effect has been more focused advocacy, but the timing of these proceedings limits to about five hours a day, which often makes hearings last much longer but forcing better preparation. With Zoom fatigue affecting the overall quality of such proceedings. Next slide, please. The downsides are it's harder to get multilateral negotiations going, harder to draft agreements. I'm sorry, go back, please. Um, Post-deliberation hearings, post-hearing deliberations and pre-hearing preparation are impaired. And the biggest issue is time zones. So for example, if you have a hearing, in fact, this conference is an illustration, US, UK, Europe, Middle East, and Singapore, 
the number of usable hours of the day is only four and a half hours. And that means that the chair would have to sit at 1 a.m. Hybrid proceedings have been possible, you heard from Colin Passmore, but few have really tried. And as mentioned, the video loses the social appeal of bringing people together in person, as well as the natural tendency of counsel to try to show off for the client. Um, these factors it will collectively create pressure to revert to in-person hearings again, once that becomes possible again. Some of the key difficulties, and next slide please, is remote simultaneous interpretation. Zoom is the best, but the UN prohibits it because of security reasons, which may now be outmoded. Ironically, as pointed out, technical difficulties from large law firms usually arise when big name partners expect to delegate technical matters to the help rather than learn it themselves. Barrister and counsel are frustrated because they think their value added is cross-examining witnesses live, although some think that proceedings are better from the tribunal's point of view and uncooperative parties can totally disrupt an online hearing. Next slide, please. This will raise three questions. Will this overly favor the repeat player bar? How much will courts and other bodies adapt and learn from the pandemic experience? And then an interesting question, can an arbitral tribunal order a virtual hearing over the objection of a party? The answer is probably yes, as a matter of inherent power, but due process principles are often invoked. The Austrian Supreme Court has already ruled on this issue saying it's not a violation of the European Convention of Human Rights, but it specified some remarkable uh, details, including, for example, the requirement that a 360 degree scan of the room be done to make sure that no text messages were being sent to prep the witness. The two qualitative issues are whether video will allow development of trust needed for all aspects of preparing the case. And as one person put it to me, will remote justice make justice feel more remote? And that person gave this uh, somber assessment. While this is manageable in the short term, there's a real risk of systemic degradation if this becomes the long-term norm. Next question, next slide, please. How about online domestic alternative dispute resolution? Um, I've talked to lots of domestic mediators. The best line was, I now understand why online dating works. <laughs> you can actually assess people's personalities and the logistics are simpler, the cost is lower, the decision makers more likely to appear. Clients are relaxed and happier. It's easier to talk. Everyone behaves better because they can see how others see them. But there's no schmooze factor. You don't bump into each other in the hallway. You don't break bread to break the ice. Next slide, please. So mediations tend to resolve faster but there's a lower settlement event effect. For example, the classic moment where someone says, I'm going to the airport and I'm not coming back. Forcing the settlement is hard to, when you say I'm in my house and I'm gonna turn off my Zoom screen. Lawyers have less control of the clients and the mediator has less ability to get in the face of uh, the parties and to get them to resolve. But the mediators I've talked to says, look, we're not going back. It's just so much cheaper. The question is no longer, when do we travel, but why should we travel? Next slide. On online domestic courts, you've just heard from an expert panel. Let me just add, <laughs> with sophisticated repeat users, online hearings are going well, especially with oral argument, less so with cross-examination. One person I talked to said, no one else will ever again pay a lawyer to wake up in the morning in New Orleans, fly to uh, Houston, do a couple hour hearing and fly back and bill 15 hours. The main hesitation is of course, criminal jury trials, taking pleas, any issue that involves individual dignity, significant losses of liberty. And in many cases, the worries about the juries are very huge because very few jury summons are being answered during a time of COVID. The Lackawanna, Pennsylvania court system just allowed judges to remove peremptory challenges to make sure the decline of citizen responses doesn't strip the jury pools of going below six. And nobody, 
nobody wants jurors to decide cases from home where their children are running around, the TV is on, or they can multitask. Uh, as one person put it to me, well, our in-person system works in part because everybody's uncomfortable and wants to get out of there as fast as possible. I have a question for the master of the roles, um, Sir Jeffrey Voss. Uh, when I was a student at Maudlin College, Oxford, I met another alum, the great Lord Denning, also the master of the roles. And he said something to me in that moment that he later put into a famous opinion. As a moth is drawn to the flame or to the light, so is a litigant drawn to the United States. It's turned out that video has authorized many US domestic arbitrators to go international, which raises the question whether European and UK litigants will be more drawn to US forums as they become increasingly available online. One of the issues that's addressed in Richard Susskind's uh, outstanding book. In all of us, I think we need to focus on what Ralph Gantz would insist on, protecting the vulnerable, dignity through participation, protecting advocacy, mitigating asymmetrics, preserving accessibility and honoring complexity. And let me say a word about each. In his commentary about Richard Susskind's last book, Ralph pointed out that written forms of advocacy can disadvantage those who don't write as well and are good at oral advocacy, a point that Kathleen just made. He pointed up that up to 25% of his cases, oral argument changed some aspect of his reasoning. Asymmetry of knowledge and skills create inequities, especially with repeat players like creditors. Next slide, please. Accessibility, on this Ralph said something that really was on point and prescient. Courts must meet the users where they are. That means language access, how to develop written translation for non-English speakers and technology access. Ralph said, wouldn't it make more sense to develop an online system through smartphones, not computers, given that so many more Americans have access to smartphones than Zoom? My wife, Christy Fisher, works for Connecticut Veterans Legal Center. None of her clients, former veterans, have Zoom. And most of them have smartphones that have a very limited number of minutes. We have to meet these users where they are. So coming to the conclusion, complexity and dignity are where Ralph really focused. He rejected the idea that everyday legal disputes are simple. He said it could be much harder to decide a high dollar, a, a much harder to decide a case about child custody or eviction than a civil suit with a lot of dollars involved. And he emphasized dignity. Justice is not the only reason the result that uh, emerges, but the feeling somebody has been heard. At Rouse investiture at the Superior Court, he said that his own judge had told him we can't make this whole unfair world fair, but we can and must do everything we can to make this courtroom a place where fairness, justice, and civility rule. I think Ralph would be committed that even in the cloud, courts can and must still be places where this is true. Ralph's request would be that courts in the cloud preserve core humane values. Of course, efficiency and cost savings, but equity, fairness, due process in the eye of the receiver, dignity, participation and respect for public health. And finally, can we even dream, as Leonora did, of online courts that can deliver better justice than we have? When we were very young, Ralph and I used to talk late into the night about the problems of the world. One night we made each other a promise. If we grew up and we ever got to positions of influence, we do everything we could in our power to make the world a fairer place. Ralph kept his promise and he used his power in all he did and how he saw the future and he was cheated out of time. But as courts in the cloud develop and they are here now, the question he leaves for us is, will we keep our promise? Thank you and thank you for letting me make this memory of my brother-in-law, Ralph Gantz. Harold, what can I say? Thank you so much for those beautiful remarks. You know, Harold and I and Debbie, we all said, 
Ralph would want whatever we did to be substantive because he was a deeply substantive person who cared about these issues. And in honoring his commitment to substance, you have honored him as a person and as a friend uh, in a magnificent way. Um, we look forward to reading those remarks and the entire symposium that will be put together with many, many people writing about Ralph's amazing legacy. And it's a perfect bridge to where we are honored to go now. Uh, because my friend Richard Suskin, when we talked about this, he said, I think I might be able to get the incoming master of the roles to come and share some time and thoughts with us. And he said to me, because he is one of the most thoughtful people I know in thinking about uh, how we move forward to get the best of this new world. And so uh, I am deeply grateful that uh, he has made time to be with us today. And I'm going to turn it back over to my friend, Richard Suskin, to give a, a proper introduction to our honored guest. Richard. Thank you very much, David. And thank you all three of you for such a, a fitting and moving tribute to Ralph. I only had the opportunity to meet him on that one occasion. And it was an online meeting. E even across the wires, I could sense what a wonderful man he was. And uh, it was a real pleasure to have worked with him, if only in that, uh, on that one time. But yes, David, thank you for giving me the, the enviable task of introducing Sir Geoffrey Voss, who's currently Chancellor of the High Court of England and Wales, and soon to be the Master of the Rolls, which is the head of civil justice in England and Wales. I've got the great good fortune of working regularly with Sir Geoffrey. We plot and plan in relation to technologies and our ideas are very much aligned. Colin Passmore of Simmons & Simmons said it well earlier, and I'm not sure the extent to which Jeffrey's aware of this, but he, he said there's a great sense of enthusiasm within the profession for, for Jeffrey taking on the role. Uh, and it is a time when considerable reforms needed, not least in relation to technology. Jeffrey, I'm not sure when you actually joined the meeting, because I know you had other commitments. Uh, I spoke, as you will know, about uh, the more distant future, but we had a wonderful panel from experienced practitioners who told us about what it's like at the, at the live end of all of this, uh, conducting uh, hearings in the broadest of terms. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the clear conclusions where these hearings work very well for oral argument, but far less well uh, for, for cross-examination. But I focus very much on video hearings. I think Harold, you may have heard Harold say he would like to hear from uh, the Master of the Rolls on the extent to which if hearings go virtual, that international dispute resolution, if I understood it, he was saying might be drawn more to America. Well, that of course overlaps with our own interest as we're both members of something called Law UK, where we're very keen that uh, the English legal system con continues to be a leading forum for the international resolution of disputes or the resolution of, of international disputes. So Jeffrey, I don't want to take up your valuable time. People would rather hear, as David said, uh, about you, uh, uh, rather from you rather than about you. So can I have over to you to to take the reins for the for for this keynote address thank you very much well thank you richard thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you david too for having invited me to speak to you today it's uh, an honor and a privilege to do so uh, let me start by giving you an overview of where i'm going to go in this short talk uh, England and Wales has always been one of a number of popular jurisdictions for the resolution of international commercial disputes. And for the last four years, I have led what we now call the business and property courts in England and Wales at the Rolls Building in London. And that building is probably the biggest commercial dispute resolution courthouse in the world pre-COVID-19, between 40 and 50 judges would sit every day to resolve every kind of business dispute in shipping, construction, insolvency, financial services, banking, intellectual property, competition, tax, and much more. And now the same number sit each day, but many, if not most of them, do so remotely. And I know from the very few minutes that I have been able to join uh, before starting to speak to you that you've had much discussion about remote hearings. 
Uh, but in January 2021, as you've heard, I'm going to be moving on to become Master of the Roles and Head of Civil Justice in England and Wales. Now that's a much broader canvas than commercial dispute resolution. And in preparation for this new role, I've been thinking a lot about civil dispute resolution far more widely than I could have done from a purely commercial standpoint. As everyone listening will know, uh, whatever they tell you, judges and lawyers the world over are instinctively conservative, and perhaps it might even be said slightly resistant to change. Court processes have developed parochially over centuries and are driven by the culture of local societies. All court systems, whether civil or common law, were developed to resolve disputes in their own country. They were not developed to resolve international disputes, let alone those arising from borderless technologies, such as the blockchain and smart contracts. And this essentially local foundation for justice systems explains why those that have grown to service international business, such as the business and property courts in England and Wales, the Singapore International Commercial Court, and the courts of the Southern District of New York, all face the same problems when it comes to creating justice systems fit for the 21st century. How do they square the resolution of massive disputes for international conglomerates with local dispute resolution for New Yorkers, Londoners or Singaporeans? The backdrop to the delivery of justice has also changed beyond recognition now that almost every individual and business in the developed world and many in the less developed world can get whatever they want instantly with a few clicks on their smart devices. And as it seems to me, there are essentially three issues that underlie the creation of the modern dispute resolution system. Uh, first, I think the emphasis should be on the resolution uh, rather than the dispute. And secondly, we should not, I think, undertake reform by simply doing digitally what was previously done in an analog way. And thirdly, we should try to approach the whole problem holistically. I will explain in a little more detail the implications of each of these underlying points. But first, let me outline the vision as I see it for the future. Justice must cater for a broad range of disputes. Leaving criminal questions on one side, that range extends from the 60 million small civil issues resolved every year by artificial intelligence on eBay, through millions of family disputes about money and children, uh, via many more millions of administrative disputes between the citizen and the state, to a range of commercially debilitating disputes faced by small and medium-sized enterprises, and ending up with the large intractable commercial cases between multinational corporations at the far end. And these disputes are dealt with by online platforms, ombudsmen, arbitrators, mediators, and sometimes, but only sometimes, by municipal courts. And it's important to understand the range of cases that is being considered when one looks for appropriate reforms. Otherwise, there is a danger that the highly lawyered tail may wag the self represented litigant dog. And there is, as I see it, no reason whatever why there should not be a single point of online entry for every dispute, however small or large, whether civil, family, commercial or administrative. A data set can be created from the outset and the dispute can then be directed towards the most appropriate resolution mechanism. 
Secondly, the process should not, I think, be governed by the concept that every case will end up in a traditional courtroom with all the witnesses, parties, lawyers, and a judge gathered together in the same place at the same time, whether uh, that gathering is actual, physically, or remote. Some may. I'm not against traditional court hearings, but when you consider the full gamut of disputes that need resolution, any ide fix about the end point needs to be carefully managed. And thirdly, mediation, resolution, compromise, settlement interventions, call it what you will, should not be, as they so often are, at a single point on the journey, but they should be an integrated part of the entire system. Parties that have a problem should be led culturally to expect that the process will be about achieving a resolution rather than about exacerbating or even necessarily always deciding who is right about the dispute that gave rise to the process. Every case can enter a metaphorical online funnel. Resolution interventions will cause many of them to settle, but if they do not settle, the process will be directed at identifying and then resolving the issues that divide the parties. It should not be about formal statements of the competing hostile positions or pleadings, as lawyers call them. The process should instead itself identify and resolve issues in a logical, progressive and conciliatory manner. As the online programs are developed within the funnel for an ever wider category of case, some will need in the early stages to leave the online sp space to be dealt with under the legacy systems. And the development process will take time, but the ultimate objective will be to create a ubiquitous online dispute resolution process that can resolve almost all kinds of issues at a proportionate cost in a reasonable time scale and without the stress of unnecessarily confrontational set piece hearings. Now, of course, there may still be a need for remote or face-to-face -face hearings or meetings at some stages and in some cases, but these should, I think, be tailored to resolution of specific issues rather than being allowed to transform themselves into costly and lengthy pitched battles. So how then do we avoid digitizing the existing process? The common law dispute resolution process is one that developed to its present form in the 19th century. But even then, hearings were generally much shorter and more peremptory because there was just so much less paper. Through the 20th century, the process became more complex as document reproduction took hold. And now the volume of data is overwhelming as a result of widely available electronic communications and social media. I make these points because it's easy to think that reform of the dispute resolution process is in some way a betrayal of the history of the common law. In my view, it is quite the reverse. If we do not bring dispute resolution processes up to date, we will drown in data even the simplest of issues will take years to resolve. And so far from promoting access to justice and the rule of law, the process itself will depreciate them. It's interesting to note what has been learnt in relation to dispute resolution from the effects of this awful pandemic. In the UK, remote hearings, whether by phone, Skype, Teams or Zoom, replaced face-to-face -face hearings in the majority of cases across the civil, family and administrative system almost overnight in March 2020. Judges, lawyers, witnesses and parties were quick to realise the advantages, even if there was a little grumbling along the way. And many are now seemingly reluctant to return to face-to-face -to -face hearings, even when they are safely available. 
remote hearings have gone well. They're not ideal, as I've heard uh, some others say before, for the resolution of every issue. But generally, they operate efficiently and save time and expense. But they are not themselves a solution. They simply replicate the old process in a technologically enabled form. And likewise, the digitization of bundles of documents and the court record is necessary and appropriate, but not a solution in itself. In order to create a justice system that can genuinely resolve the wide range of disputes that arise in our society, we need a fresh approach that takes account of existing circumstances. Now those circumstances bear no relation to those that existed in either the 19th or the 20th centuries. Those circumstances are the ready availability of the internet to all our businesses and citizens, the massive accumulation of data affecting every aspect of our commercial and personal lives, and the availability of smart systems and artificial intelligence that can process that data and assist us in every aspect of our experience. None of these circumstances is going away. Technology will grow rather than recede. Moreover, disputes will themselves become more technological in nature. In financial services alone, there are, we are told, likely to be trillions of smart contracts recorded on the blockchain and blockchain technology is likely to affect every aspect of consumers' lives. Once it's in regular use by utilities, by land and intellectual property registries, by central bank digital currencies, telecoms and corporations and industries in every sector. Once you realize the kind of society for which dispute resolution is required in the future, it becomes obvious that it would not be sufficient to put our existing procedures online. But why, for example, would one want an online process that simply required the same old pleadings and formal documents to be drafted and uploaded to the dispute resolution platform when simple programming can arrive at the issue in an ordinary case far more efficiently? In most cases, the issue is really very simple. Was the car going too fast? Did John lend Mary $500? Did the defendant pay the mortgage installments that were due? The objective in all cases must be to identify the real issue in dispute by the quickest possible route. And that route may vary, but the objective should remain. The part of this analysis that is most contentious with lawyers is the part that suggests in many that in many cases, traditional oral hearings may not be necessary. But I've already said twice that I accept the need for some hearings, even in a reformed online process. What I think one needs, however, is the streamlining that aims to resolve online as large a percentage of the cases as possible using a series of targeted interventions. We have experience in the UK of parties to small claims thinking that because they paid a fee to issue their claim, they're entitled to a hearing by a real judge and implicitly a judgment in their favor. I would prefer them to think of any fee they pay as a fee for the solution of a problem, not for the hearing of a dispute. And this also affects commercial cases where the ultimate trial becomes a goal in itself with mediated interventions sidelined and undervalued. So, so where would an online process leave the lawyers? There's no doubt that many lawyers, whilst acknowledging the sense of what is proposed in this talk, hope that the comfortable dispute resolution process of yesteryear may continue at least until they retire. In my view, lawyers should be more ambitious. Precisely the same parameters that make a new dispute resolution process essential ensure that lawyers and legal advice 
will thrive in the coming century. The advance of technology, big data, the blockchain and smart contracts will lead to different, perhaps more complicated personal and business relationships. Lawyers should always concentrate on adding value for their clients. They will be needed more than ever as the complexities of everyday life and commerce increase. There is no need for lawyers to specialize, for example, in drafting repetitive court documentation when the issues that divide parties can be dispelled and resolved online in half the time and at a quarter of the cost. But there is and always will be a need for lawyers to advise their clients on their future commercial decisions, their transactions past and present, and the merits of their dispute, and for them to assist the courts, whether online or not, in resolving them. The issues arising in relation to families and between the individual and the state are hardly likely to become any more straightforward in a technological era. So what then about international arbitration and major commercial disputes? I turn then to, to the commercial lawyers litigating these massive disputes, either in the commercial courts in the UK, the US, Singapore, or at international arbitration. How can my perspective possibly apply to them? Surely the case with millions of documents, dozens of witnesses, and billions of dollars at stake will always take many weeks or months to resolve in a physical courtroom. Well, my answer to that is maybe. These were the kinds of cases that I was involved in when I was at the bar. However voluminous the documentation, I always found that even the most complex case boiled down to an analysis of a very few documents and perhaps one or two difficult points of law. We see that as cases progress up the appellate ladder. They become more focused and simpler. As appellate judges are fond of saying, it was argued quite differently before us. We only saw that single point. The trick, I think, is to identify the single point or the very few real points, whether evidential or legal, at an early stage. And artificial intelligence and the legal discipline of experienced lawyers can help with this. There is a tendency for lawyers to want to argue every point, good, bad, or indifferent, whether it's from fear of being sued themselves or simply to impress their clients. But this is a tendency that should be resisted and would I think be a tactic that would be harder to pursue if the process were put substantially online. So let me attempt to draw a few of the threads together. I do not think that judges and lawyers have a choice about the direction of travel. The only real question is when they get with the program. Our present method of courthouse based dispute resolution is simply not fit for the present era. It cannot cope with massive data, smart technologies, the blockchain, smart contracts and the artificial intelligence that epitomizes the world in which we all now live. And I believe that we owe it to the generations that have grown up with technology to use our experience to fashion new online dispute resolution mechanisms that can provide what my generation never had, namely access to justice for all, for all levels of dispute, whether trivial and soluble by Amazon or eBay, or serious and requiring the attention of a state judiciary. <clears throat> it should go without saying that there are three parameters on which we cannot and will not compromise. First, the integrity of the judges and the system itself. Secondly, the imperative that any new approach to justice must command the confidence and respect of our populations. And thirdly, the quality of justice delivered. The new processes will, I think, provide better justice for a new generation 
which has different expectations. Justice cannot be so expensive and so delayed that it is in truth unattainable. Thank you. So Richard, I'll just say, I see why there's so much excitement in the UK uh, around Sir Geoffrey Voss's ascension to being master of the roles. Uh, we cannot thank you enough for that really thoughtful uh, and deeply substantive uh, discussion with us of, of the challenges, but also the opportunities that we face here, prompted of course by my friend Richard's uh, brilliant start to our discussion. What we're gonna do now is try to engage some other voices and uh, uh, Sir, Boss, uh, Sir Jeffrey Voss has very kindly agreed to, to stay and perhaps engage and answer with some questions. And we're going to start with uh, three people who have a, a unique perspective on the issues that we've now been discussing and who are struggling with them themselves in their own way, in their own court systems. Uh, each one uh, I'm going to call on in turn uh, who will... Uh, say a, a word about themselves and then ask a question uh, for one uh, uh, or, the, or all of us to answer. Uh, we won't actually be able to see them because that's the format of the constraint of the webinar we're in, but you'll get to actually hear their voices. Um, so the first person I, I want to call on is uh, my dear friend and former uh, Harvard Law School classmate, one, one, I mean, not like, no, I shouldn't say that he was my student. He wasn't my classmate, but he was my colleague at Harvard Law School. And now he, like Kathleen, has also gone on to greater glory. Uh, this is David Barron, who's a judge on the uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals here in the United States. And uh, Judge Barron, uh, would you unmute yourself and please ask your question? Thank you, David. And thank, can I be heard? Yes, okay, great. Thank you, uh, David, for inviting me to do this and for putting on this symposium for uh, Ralph Gantz. I mean, among the many great qualities of him was he was also very good as a mentor. And uh, me as a young judge, uh, I know he took me uh, aside and, and helped me a great deal in activating myself to the bench, um, which is just one of the many great qualities about him. But Sir Voss, I really uh, was struck by uh, how stimulating and thought-provoking your talk was, and, and it prompted me to think about an issue that we face on our circuit and that I think is um, endemic to the U.S. justice system, which is that there's obviously local variation in the content of law by jurisdiction. So the federal government has its own laws, the state governments have their own laws, each state has its own law. But even within jurisdictions that have their own law, there's an amazing amount of local variation. That's true among the circuits, which are all applying federal law. It's true even within circuits, within each district, and the federal district courts have their own rules. They'll have their own pattern jury instructions. They'll have their own way of conducting rules for lawyers to follow. And all of that, what your talk made me think about is to some extent an artifact of geography and the extent to which the place where courts are located has been thought to justify them having their own set of rules unique to them. And I take it a thrust of your talk pushes towards a questioning of that assumption and towards uniformity more generally, which I know from experience is not something that always goes over very well with judges. And so I just wonder how you think about the relationship between uniformity and disuniformity in light of the observations that you're making. Well, I think that's a very interesting question. You may have noticed at the beginning of the talk, I, I mentioned something that I feel very strongly, which is that parochial systems of justice, particularly in Europe, are very parochial. Uh, they, are, they were devised in particular countries, whether it's Slovakia or the Czech Republic or Italy or France or Poland, to deal with questions in those particular countries. And they all have very complex and, 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 and prescriptive procedural laws, exactly what you're talking about. Just as we do, we have something called the civil procedure rules introduced by Lord Wolfe in 1999, but in substantive terms, it's no different to what it replaced, um, which is, uh, came from 1875. 
So nothing has really changed. The rules are very prescriptive. Uh, my idea is that the online space allows us to free ourselves from those prescriptive rules because there is a different and higher objective, namely the identification of the issue between the party parties and the resolution of the issue. And if you are laying down prescriptive rules which actually prevent the speedy and cost-effective resolution of a dispute, then you are not giving access to justice. And our modern technology can free us from many of those constraints. And in the UK, we're at the moment considering the introduction of online rules, which would be at a much higher level of generality than the current prescriptive rules that you have and we have. And I think you're right. Uh, once a uniform or more uniform set of high level rules, which simply laid down the standard uh, was available in one country, it would quickly spread. And I just allow myself one more comment because the UNCITRAL and the European Law Institute have actually already written a set of rules, a common set of European procedural rules that are at a high level. They ignore most of the prescriptive rules in European countries and in the UK, and they are intended to be applicable everywhere. And when I first heard about that project in 2013, I said that won't finish until 2050. It's never going to happen, but it's happened. And it's very worthwhile looking, not because perhaps it's the last word on the subject, but because it shows it can be done. Richard, any uh, thoughts on your part on that question? On that particular question, uh, nothing to add. Am I allowed to, David, do you give me permission to, to make another, another observation? You do, I will. I, I just, I, maybe I'll ask the Chancellor this uh, part of that. I'd love to have you make your observation and we'll move to our next questioner. I wonder, Chancellor, um, will there be pressure? I, I, you, you described it, I think, quite well as thinking about what the uniform procedural rules that will be to get to the heart of the matter. But as law professors, we often talk about the interaction between procedure and substance, and that we also have different substantive laws in different jurisdictions around, uh, and certainly in our country, that's a deep part. And, and so as people, the, the resistance to uniform procedure is often met by the idea that it's going to change the substance in some way or push towards a more uniform substance in a way that seems much more controversial. And I wonder if you've thought about that particular kerfuffle. Well, I, I don't agree, um, but I know it's an argument that is raised. And uh, the worst example, perhaps, is when um, in Belgium they introduced something called the Belgium International Commercial Court um, as a result, really, of Brexit, because they thought they would be able to resolve their own um, international commercial disputes instead of coming to London. And the, the argument was fierce because the Belgian lawyers says this is illegal because it doesn't follow the Belgian procedural code. And our law is in danger, our substantive law is in danger if you don't arrive at your procedural resolution in the correct way. Now, I'm afraid I, I disagreed with that and I disagree with what you're saying. Well, not what you're saying, but what people are putting forward yeah. because actually, the procedure has developed in order to allow the substantive issue to be resolved, whether it's one of law or fact. And by the way, 90% of our procedural laws and rules, if not 95, are aimed at resolving issues of fact fairly, not law, because legal issues really speak for themselves. We all have experience of having a case where you say to your fellow judges, if you're sitting in an appellate court, this is wonderful, this is just a wonderful point of law, we're going to really enjoy the day or whatever it is, um, because there's no procedure, it's just a lovely point of law, whatever it might be. And that, that doesn't concern procedure. So it's a complete myth, I think, to think that changing the process will change the ultimate decision-making resolution of substantive law. Thank you very much. 
Richard, did you want to say something before we go to our next question? Yes, very briefly. It's, it's an observation, but it, it relates to uh, something uh, Jeffrey was saying that uh, one of the past uh, master of the roles, uh, Lord Dyson in, in England and Wales, once said that any system that's got a 2,000 page user manual has a problem. And he's referring to the rules of procedure for, for our civil courts. And some people talk about it, and I think it's very important, the simplification of rules. But I just wanted to add that there's also a trend for those who are building online dispute resolution platforms that you actually embed the rules within the system. And that's to say, for people who are not particularly knowledgeable, uh, they do not, on many occasions, they don't need to know what the rules require. They simply need to follow the steps that are laid out for them. Now, clearly, we're not talking here about very large, complex disputes. But going back to my earlier theme of offering access to justice, if we really are going to make our civil courts far more widely available, not only do we need to reduce the complexity and quantity of the rules, but it seems to me we need, in a sense, to hide them as well by embedding them within the system. So it was simply an observation rather than a question. Thank you very much, Richard. Our, our next questioner, again, it gives me great pleasure to introduce, and, and I, this may become a theme, but was also my student who has gone on to great glory and has gone on actually to succeed our dear friend, uh, Chief Justice Gantz, and is now herself the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, and that's Justice Budd. And uh, Justice Kim Budd, would you please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Hi, can anyone hear me? Yes. Uh, Professor Wilkins, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to participate in this important and timely uh, program. And I also wanted to just briefly thank Harold Coe uh, for his remarks and his pictures of our chief, uh, Ralph Gantz. Um, you know, uh, Ralph's untimely passing was devastating to the entire judiciary in Massachusetts. He was a mentor and friend to me. Uh, and although I will work very hard to be a worthy successor, I'm well aware that I have big shoes to fill. Uh, to, now to my question, um, Sir Voss, I was fascinated to hear your thoughts about the future of the court system and dispute resolution generally. Obviously, uh, we like courts everywhere have ramped up our use of technology to try to keep the wheels of justice turning uh, during the pandemic. And as you pointed out, uh, using technology is, is going to continue long after uh, we can start to get together in large numbers in person. Harold Coe referenced uh, Chief Gantz's concern about the fact that many pro se litigants do not have ready access to technology outside of perhaps a smartphone. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how courts might think about using technology to facilitate access to justice for, for this category of litigants. What should we be thinking about as we prioritize um, allocating scarce resources? Well, I think we, we think in England a lot about uh, vulnerable litigants, and there are, of course, many. Uh, but um, it's, a, it's another case where you have to make sure that those people are not disadvantaged in a justice system, but you don't create an entire justice system for uh, those small percentage which are disadvantaged. You simply make sure that they have other means of accessing the system you create. And that's what we're doing. I mean, for example, there are a decreasing number, but a, a, a still a large number of people who can only use paper, who don't even have a smartphone. And then there are others who don't have a computer, but they do have a smartphone. And actually a smartphone is pretty effective. I mean, I know that um, people at my age find it rather difficult to use a smartphone for the things that we use a computer for but people in their teens and twenties don't find any difficulty with that at all and can write a document on a smartphone faster than you can write it on a computer. So I don't think we should underestimate actually the, the use of smart technology. And I also think that it's just a question of, uh, of dealing with the communities themselves. And, uh, you know, as somebody mentioned earlier, there's often a case, a case of linguistic 
problems where you have multi languages, um, people can't speak uh, the, the common lingua franca, and they need a lot of help to get access to a justice system. I mean, we have in London, a vast number of languages spoken by our population. And uh, the justice system makes it accessible for all of them. But again, don't let the tail wag the dog. Uh, the fact that that makes it a problem does not inform how you create the best access to justice for the majority of businesses and individuals. And you have to think, as I say, holistically about all the types of dispute that you're resolving. It's no good just thinking of whether it's possession disputes or money claims or um, commercial disputes. You have to think of the many disputes that exist between individuals and the state, the many disputes that exist between families and family lawyers. I was on a seminar last night where a family lawyer said, well, all this is very interesting, but in family lawyer, family lawyers always have to operate face to face. Not so. Our family justice system has, has taken like a duck to water to remote hearings. So we, sh we shouldn't assume that anything I think about technology because I take the view that the, the young people, there will be vulnerable people amongst the youth as well as the aged, but the young vulnerable people will be able to use and adopt technology and will find it actually more useful to make sure they're included, it's less likely to exclude them than it did in the past. Well, that's actually a perfect segue to our next questioner who is thinking a lot about technology and I know Richard knows him well. Uh, and it also raises an issue that um, some of the questions that have been coming in, we've been monitoring uh, in the Q&A function uh, about things that are happening outside of uh, either Europe or the US. Uh, you mentioned language and uh, we like to think of ourselves as two people divided by a common language in the old joke. Uh, but in Asia, there are lots of interesting ish, uh, uh, experimentation going on here. And, in Singapore in particular. And we are very lucky that uh, Kedwe Tan has agreed to join us. He is uh, the uh, head of innovation for the Singapore court system. And so Kedwe, would you please unmute yourself and ask- Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilkins for calling on me and good morning from Singapore. I look after transformation and innovation for the Singapore judiciary across the different levels of court, and we are seeking to implement a vision that was charted by our Chief Justice. Now, we are in full agreement that we should not replicate paper processes and also that we should do a lot more to enhance access to justice so that people who cannot afford or, or may not even know about uh, how to hire lawyers can seek legal remedies that they should have available to them. And we are also, as uh, suggested very strongly by, by Richard, pushing ahead with asynchronous hearing capabilities and the little bits of technology to support this so that lawyers can reply and take part in such hearings you know, on their smartphones. Although some have questioned whether this might not result in some unfortunate utterances by parties as they're traveling on the tube or uh, traveling home and, or in the midst of an argument at home. Uh, the jury is in any case still out as to whether and how successful these various efforts would be for us here in Singapore. But we do know that the UK has embarked on a very ambitious reform program. And I wonder if it is possible for the Chancellor uh, to share with us some thoughts as to how this program has been coming along and whether or not there are some top uh, takeaways that you may recommend to other jurisdictions uh, or conversely, are there certain experiments that with the value of hindsight, uh, you would suggest that perhaps need not be tried? Thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, the reform program in the UK has been a very large one. And of course, we have quite a large justice system because in the US, for example, it's broken down into states. Uh, whereas we only have really one justice system in England and Wales. And um, therefore the reform program has to be very ambitious. 
And I'm not going to pretend or suggest that it's a completely smooth ride from um, the beginning to the end uh, without interruption. We still have, for example, to digitize the county court, uh, which is the court that deals with the small, smaller court disputes. But actually, uh, we have done really well and we brought forward an online civil money claims. So you can bring a money claim under 10,000 pounds online. Uh, we're about to start with small damages claims. They can be brought online. And we're going to then, well, we've already started with possession claims, with divorce claims, and with some social security claims uh, disputes can be brought online. So it's a, it's a very big project and the criminal justice system has also been digitized. So there, a lot has been done with a big system. It's uh, something that takes time. And one thing we've learned is that it's absolutely imperative that every part of the system you're creating talks to other parts. And not as easily said as done because we have, the, we're creating 50 what we call common components. For example, the component that uh, whereby a court user pays a fee to the court, the component whereby the judge signs on to uh, his or her computer every morning to find out the schedule, the scheduling and listing component. And there are 50 of them, you won't be surprised to hear across the justice system. And if they don't talk to one another, then you're stymied in, in a most impossible way. And I won't pretend that that hasn't happened um, at some stages in the process. But we're on track now. And I think the most important thing is to make sure that you have at least an, a direction of travel in view when you begin. It's a little bit like what I was saying in my talk. I'm not pretending that, that uh, one um, vision is the complete story. What I'm saying is we need a direction of travel towards a justice system which works for a, a society which operates with the technological changes that are now taking place. Um, um, you know, I was brought up in the days of fool's cap paper and tipex, where if you, if you had to change a document, you used something in a bottle that smelled terrible and made you feel ill. And um, that's a long time ago now, but I'm not going to be able to predict, only Richard can predict what's gonna happen in 20 years time technologically. But all I can say is I must create a system which will work for people who are being born now and people who are born in the future, not just for old people like me who are going to fall off their perch before too long. And it, it, it's unfortunate that the leaders in our society are often old people who don't have a very, um, a very forward looking view. And they think that what's happened in the past is all jolly good. And I'm not saying what happened in the past is bad. I'm just saying I want to replicate it and make it accessible to people who are being born now. Well, uh, we certainly hope you don't fall off your post anytime soon, but Richard, uh, would you maybe comment a little bit about what else you're seeing around the world? Because uh, we have several participants from, from other countries or, uh, around the world as well. And uh, what, what, at least innovative, are you seeing? Well, thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey kind of said, uh, I think it's being amusing that I could tell the future. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that the least likely future is that nothing will change. And yet that is the premise upon which many lawyers and courts uh, base their strategy. Uh, what I can also say to you, and we can come back and discuss it in a decade's time, that it's likely that legal and court life will be dramatically altered by 2030 by technologies that haven't yet been invented. I see both of these things just to suggest to you, and it was what I was seeing in my earlier talk about the new orthodoxy, that uh, the panel, wonderful though it was, was very much assuming that uh, the future is a variation on video hearings. And so that's why uh, I'm fascinated by different kinds of developments around the world. When Jeffrey was talking about these various online processes, incidentally, he wasn't referring to uh, video hearings. He was meaning the more the asynchronous type hearing for possession claims, uh, damages claims, uh, small claims, and so forth. Um, what the, I mentioned earlier, but I just want to say a little bit about it, because I think it's the best case study uh, to look at in Canada, the Civil Resolution Tribunal. Uh, and although it's a tribunal and not a court, it's still a, a state-based public resolution system. 
And it is fascinating how it works, that uh, it's designed not by lawyers for lawyers, but using a technique that's known as design thinking, uh, very much user-centric, trying to develop a whole set of tools and techniques that non-lawyers can, uh, can use without uh, difficulty. No one's anti-lawyer in all of this, it's just that the current system is unaffordable to most. And so the first step or the first stage is a, what's known as a solution explorer. And it's a piece of diagnostic software that actually helps people uh, understand what their legal position is. And this is very powerful. And it's designed for someone who has a, a reading age of 10. Um, and this goes back to the, the point about the vulnerable and those who are, who are perhaps not, if not computer literate, perhaps not really fully uh, familiar with or comfortable with legal language. This is quite the contrary with the Canadian system, which is designed for people to speak in a very, a very plain English language. And if the solution, sometimes the solution explorer will, uh, as it were, dissolve the problem rather than resolve it, and, or, um, uh, but, but sometimes people will need additional help and there's online facilities for negotiation, for facilitation, and the decisions that, uh, or the outcomes of these processes uh, actually can, through the tribunal online, can be given the authority essentially of a court order. Some cases do eventually reach, reach some kind of a adjudicator, the tribunal members or tribunal chairman uh, or chairpeople, but uh, almost none of these cases is ever conducted in person. Uh, and they're not virtual hearings either. Again, they're all done in the papers. So if you want to see a full case study of something that's been built from the ground up, you can see it there. There's similar developments in China, in Australia, um, in, in the United States too. The, William Gibson, the science fiction writer, once said, the future has arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And I think that's right. I think what we can look at is illustrations of bits and pieces of the future. If you aggregate these, it adds up to a very different system. I just want to urge people to think beyond, uh, not to ignore, but to build on the success of video hearings rather than thinking that's the, this is the, the end game. What strikes me though, as never before, is that we have many academics, we've got many practitioners, many judges who are now very interested in seeing how they can push the, the boundaries. They're fascinated in the way in which we might embrace technology. And, and so it's early days. Uh, for me, still the asynchronous hearing is, and the extended courts are the most attractive uh, ways ahead for high volume, low value cases. It remains to be seen how quickly they're taken up across the world. Uh, Jeff is absolutely right though, but not letting the tail wag the dog. Very often when you talk of these systems, people argue from hard cases. They take either very vulnerable people or very complex cases and wonder why a basic technological system doesn't fully meet their needs. I just wanted to close on saying that quite useful, I think, in, in the approach in the English reform program is something called assisted digital. And that's a way of meeting the needs of very vulnerable people. It's not saying we run a parallel manual system. It's saying that people who are vulnerable get assistance in using the, the digital system. And I think that's entirely appropriate. So what we need to do as a community globally is bring together, we try to do this to some extent, remote courts worldwide, try to bring together these kinds of uh, insights and developments so that we can all avoid duplicating effort and reinventing the wheel. So we're gonna talk about that in our last session, Richard, because it's such a fascinating project. But uh, before we let Chancellor Voss go, you've, who's been so incredibly generous with his, his time uh, to be with us this afternoon or evening, I think in, in your time, um, we've gotten several questions in the chat that actually uh, go to something that was discussed in the uh, advocates panel earlier in the day, and I'm not quite sure how much you had a chance to hear that, but it, it goes to another kind of hard case. And, and not so much hard case, perhaps, but another way of thinking about the courts, which is uh, as, a, as a kind of ceremonial important place in which there's a certain kind of majesty, as uh, Kathleen Sullivan talked about, uh, about court proceedings, which is actually very valuable, she says, to the clients who come to the court. Uh, and it's also, uh, sometimes a source of uh, a place for protest. So in our jurisdiction, uh, you probably are happy you don't have this, although uh, maybe you do. Uh, you know, whenever there's a Supreme Court hearing of a controversial case, there's a whole mob of people who come and stand out on the steps and protest. And that that's become a very important symbol of uh, how the law is operating. And so 
I wonder as someone who's thinking about perhaps the most magisterial court system in the world and certainly one with uh, one of the longest traditions, uh, how you think about that aspect when you think about these issues? Well, I, I don't think you can teach us anything about dressing up. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're pretty good at that. And um, uh, we've certainly had a magisterial court system, although I was surprised when I went to the Cour de Cassation in Paris to realize that their building, or certainly their courtroom, is, is more grand than anything we sport in the UK with plenty of gold um, all around. But seriously, uh, we do have people who demonstrate outside courts in the UK when there are important hearings being decided. And obviously that's a good um, venting point uh, for tension, which um, shouldn't be discouraged. But again, I don't think we should tailor the system. I think you said it yourself, this is another hard case. I don't think we should tailor the system to particularly encourage or discourage that. I think the grandeur is something that, that older people value because it's something that um, has come to represent for them state justice. Um, it's not necessarily the case that younger people value state justice in the same way, and the, or rather that they, they see state justice in the same way. They may respect the judge just as much, but be quite happy to look at the judge on a screen. And I think um, one of the things that I said at the end of my talk is under no circumstances must we compromise on the integrity of the judges, the integrity of the system and the confidence that people have in that system. And when we do surveys in the UK, which we do very regularly as to what people think of the judiciary, I'm pleased to say that even amongst young people, we still come out um, very high on the on the level of, of confidence. People trust judges much more than they do many other kinds of people. Not, not as much as doctors, but uh, many more, much more than politicians and other types of people. So I think the key to it is not just to go in for grandeur and dressing up or big courthouses, but to make sure that the process is um, sufficiently respected and we are developing systems, we're developing programs that will instill into people the formality of the process, a respect for the process, but without it necessarily being in a big building um, with lots of uh, wigs and gowns. You can, you can actually have a very simple um, online process, if, if you do have to have a, a virtual hearing or a real hearing, you, we don't dress up anymore for civil cases in all the things that you recognize. Uh, we wear a simple gown like you do, and we're still just, I think, as well respected as we were. And I think it'll change. I think that the system will be respected without any of that. But you have to look again to the people that you're asking to respect the system. In the old days, people went to a lawyer if they wanted to buy a house and sat in a room with the lawyer for some hours discussing the purchase of a house. They don't do that anymore, but they still respect the lawyer and buy the house. I, I think, David, there's terminological issue here to some extent. Um, our Chief Justice talks about the solemnity of the occasion preserving that, which I like rather than the, the majesty. Uh, there's a question here, uh, I think, about whether or not there is any intrinsic value in majesty. It goes a bit back to my thing that patients don't want uh, doctors, they want health. I'm not sure court users want majesty. They want some kind of authoritative, respectful, serious outcome. Uh, we have to watch as lawyers, we don't confuse how we've always done things with the outcomes and the results that the community want of us. I think Jeffy's point is so powerful with the next generation. What might seem majestic to our generation may seem much the reverse. And so insofar as, and I think the rule of law is at stake here, that we want our court systems to be regular, to regularly affirm the authority and the bindingness of law, 
by being relevant and solving a wide range of problems, it's important to me that that's not simply perpetuating our past practices or automating our past practices, but that we are designing a system, again, I think using design thinking techniques that meets the, ne the, the needs of the next generation and not the past generation. Jeffrey's point is also right that the, the issue is that many of the policymakers and the decision makers are of a later generation than those who are going to be the users. Well, I can't think of a better way to, to end on than uh, to, with the hope of having an incoming master of the roles who takes that kind of thinking to thinking about one of the most important court systems of the world. Uh, Chancellor Voss, we cannot thank you enough for taking the time uh, to be with us here. I know how busy your schedule is, but I know that uh, it was immensely valuable for everyone, including myself, uh, to have the chance to hear your thinking about this. And I hope you won't mind if through Richard or others, we, we check in and, and see how things are going. And if there's any way in which we at the Center on the Legal Profession or Harvard Law School more generally, or any of the listeners on this uh, call can help, we certainly would love to do so. But let's now, again, if there were all thousand people in the room, they would rise as one and give you a rousing uh, thunderous applause, but we don't do that in the online world. So I will just give you my deep thanks and, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, David. Richard, uh, we have uh, come to the last uh, session here uh, of what is, at least for me, but just an immensely fascinating and rewarding day. And we wanted to put aside some time at the end, um, not to summarize because there's been so much that's been said, but to look forward. And uh, as I said at the outset, for those of you who were with us uh, back at 10 o'clock Eastern time when we began this day, that the Center on the Legal Profession really has these sort of three broad missions. It has research, it has teaching, and it has what we call bridging or connecting communities together. Uh, this seminar has been, I think, a magnificent example of the importance of that bridging function, of getting a conversation going uh, across different lines, across geographies, across the bench of the bar, the academy, and the profession. Uh, and we certainly want to continue that discussion. And I'm going to ask Richard towards the end of our last session to talk a little bit about some of the efforts that he's already have underway in his remote court worldwide uh, community that he's put together. But I've asked uh, one of my terrific uh, younger colleagues to come and talk to us for a little bit about some of the research that he's doing that really directly goes to some of the key issues that we've talked about here, including one that came up uh, repeatedly during the uh, uh, practitioner segment around how do you think about uh, conducting online uh, credibility assessments of witnesses? How do you think about, you know, maybe it'll work in an appellate context, but not in a trial context. And my colleague, Jim Greiner, uh, who is uh, really doing pioneering research on a range of issues, uh, trying to bring serious empirical techniques, uh, including randomized uh, controlled experiments of the kind that we see in many other areas to law and legal questions. And I know because he and I were on another uh, Zoom in which we were talking about some of these issues that he has some fascinating work that he's been doing. And so he's agreed uh, to pop in, which I, I see him. I'm not sure if you were going to see you, Jim, or we're only going to hear you on the screen, but he's gonna talk a little bit about the work that he's doing and hopefully that will both prompt some further exchange and ideas. So Professor Greiner. Thank you, David. Thank you, Richard. It's terrific to see you. Uh, good to see you, Harold. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity. I am sorry that I was not able to join you earlier this morning. Um, and so I fear that if, if, if some of what I uh, discussed this morning, some of the themes are or this afternoon are repetitive. I do apologize for that. Uh, I was teaching uh, this morning and, and so could only join you now. Um, the, uh, very briefly, the research that the Access to Justice Lab, which I direct, is pursuing 
uh, is structurally uh, attempting to investigate two, uh, uh, two issues. First of all, to what extent can we move court procedures uh, online and preserve values that we want preserve and further values that have been insufficiently uh, furthered in our, in our current uh, uh, set setup, which privileges live in-person interactions. Um, and second, uh, to what extent uh, can we, uh, or would it be a good idea to make uh, some court proceedings asynchronous? And I suspect that both of those uh, themes have been uh, front and center uh, in this discussion this morning. To add some specificity to them, um, we we are uh, attempting to implement, we have not gotten there yet, we're attempting to implement uh, or in early stages of implementing a study um, in uh, a United, with the United States jurisdiction in which we would randomize uh, whether uh, jury trials are online or whether they are, uh, or whether they are in person in a traditional format. The impetus for this uh, unsurprisingly was the pandemic uh, because if you think about the way we do uh, jury trials, especially jury selection, a jury trial is an instantaneous super spreader event of COVID-19. There is no better way uh, to spread uh, a disease than to get a cross section of the community together for uh, and, and, and force them to sit in a close proximity in a poorly ventilated courtroom uh, and then, uh, then uh, decide that you didn't need 90% of them in the first place and dispense with them because uh, that is roughly the, for the fraction of people that we call to jury duty and then send back at least to the United States uh, because we will no longer have them serve and then send them back into their uh, respective uh, places in the community from where they came. Uh, and so that's a, uh, you know, again, from a public health point of view, that's a tremendously awful idea. Um, and so uh, given that the court systems, many court systems in the United States are currently shut, uh, including the criminal system, they cannot reconstitute jury trials and speedy trial uh, values have been uh, sacrificed. Uh, what can we do to resume uh, the, the criminal system uh, with the jury trials that it needs and in addition thereby unpack the and, and unclog the civil system because the same courts that are shut down uh, and uh, with the criminal cases in front are adjudicating the civil cases and the civil cases can't get through uh, until the criminal cases do. And so uh, that has given us the idea of uh, which was a brown for a long time of online jury trials uh, and uh, it, uh, and uh, attempting to investigate those. And then the idea, well, if this was a good idea during a COVID or a pandemic context, what about when we emerge from a pandemic context? There are a series of objections to the idea. I tend to categorize them into some, in order to understand them, uh, into some discrete categories. Some are, can we do this well? Um, and the answer is yes, if we have the right technology. So things like preserving uh, attorney-client privilege communications between a, a defendant and the, uh, and the attorney. That can be done well with technology. It does require attention to it. Uh, can uh, we uh, get everybody heard? Can we, can we see the witness clearly? Can we see the, hear the testimony clearly? Can we solve the digital divide that might uh, divide jurors from the, the court proceedings? Those are all implementation issues that we have the ability to solve. The question is, do we have the co commitment and, the, and the, the funding that they might require? Then there are some other uh, questions that, uh, <clears throat> uh, that are, uh, are already heard in, the, in a few minutes I was able to join you with this afternoon, I heard considered. So the legalities in, uh, the, in the unique United States context, when we have uh, quote unquote confrontation clause values in the criminal context. Um, and so does the right to confrontation, for instance, of a witness against you, uh, include the right to confront the jury, or is it just the witness? And if the confrontation is does include the right to confront the jury, does it include uh, is a virtual confrontation sufficient, or does it have to be an in-person uh, sufficient uh, in-person uh, confrontation? These are all areas in which there is some case law. Most of the case law is dictum, but we have examples from United States courts of fact finding, not jury fact finding but fact finding that has been done uh, with uh, judges in say suppression hearings, a hearing from witnesses uh, via closed circuit television or via internet link. Um, and so this is hardly a revolutionary idea and a completely new idea. But we, we can look behind those legal per, uh, uh, concerns and say, why would we have, why would we have an instinct that says that we need an in-person interaction? And there I think, the primary, uh, an example of one primary concern is deception detection. And this is what David was referring to previously. 
Uh, I've had a chance to do some research into the existing state of knowledge on deception detection. Um, and there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that in-person uh, interactions facilitate deception detection and therefore truth finding, the, the jury's truth finding function. Uh, in fact, all of the evidence that does exist uh, that, uh, is that uh, deception detection is equally effective uh, 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 online uh, or in, uh, a, even with a, reading a transcript. But the better way to put it would be to say equally ineffective, because it turns out that human beings are just simply awful uh, at deception detection. Uh, the literature that I've uh, read thus far coalesces around a deception, a successful deception detection rate of around 54, 55%. So a few percentage points better than a coin flip in terms of deception detection. In case you're wondering, there is no evidence that professionals who repeatedly uh, encounter these situations do any better than lay people. So there's no evidence to suggest, in fact, there is some evidence the contrary, judges are no better at this than jurors. Uh, there is no evidence to suggest that groups are better at it than individuals, except when groups have prior interaction, they, then groups know each other, which is precisely what we don't do with juries. So that is an example of considering the structural reasons why we might have legal protections that would prevent us from moving to an online environment and, and hoping to say, well, maybe we can think of those and take those into account when we are understanding the extent of the application of those legal principles to a new a type of environment like an online jury trial. The other structural uh, 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 element here that I mentioned to begin with was asynchronicity. In other words, the idea of recording a jury trial and, and having uh, individuals watch it, uh, maybe giving jurors three or four days to watch the jury trial and then maybe having them debate uh, or deliberate synchronously, but having them watch a recording and then rendering a verdict uh, and, and that way. There are, again, there is, there is little evidence on this. And I think we, we should be cautious in rejecting uh, the uh, 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 solutions as to which we, potential solutions to problems as to which we have little, little evidence. Um, uh, in particular, it might be that, uh, for example, allowing asynchronicity and, and virtual interactions would open, uh, would solve problems of unrepresentative juries that plague the, you know, the United States legal system because people who were unable to participate in juries in person or even synchronously might be well be able to do so asynchronously. Um, that said, deception detection are not, is not, and, and truth finding is not the only value. And again, I did hear this in the few minutes before I was able to log in. The uh, judiciary has neither, uh, neither uh, the, uh, the purse nor the sword and must therefore rely on uh, persuasion. And majesty, uh, for majesty's sake, I could not agree more with Richard to say that that is not a value that we, on, uh, we want to uh, to, uh, to further. Nevertheless, the example of religion and the important role that ritual plays in religion persuades me that we should also empirically investigate whether we need ritual or some kind of uh, solemnity, which I think is the value that, that, that you uh, articulated, Richard, um, uh, in order to persuade the public that we are doing something that is uh, important and worthwhile, even if in the end of the day, the deception detection is little better than a coin flip. Um, and it may also be, and this is part that I find nauseating, it may also be that the, uh, the solemnity and the ritual uh, impress upon the public uh, the, uh, it, it, the idea that there is deception detection or going on even when we cannot accomplish it. And so there's a sort of false consciousness there, which again is, is poisonous in many ways. On the other hand, if people are more likely to tell untruths when they know we can't detect deception, that might be a bad thing for the legal system. And so these are all investigations that these are, leads us to in our investigations to try to measure various outcome variables via surveys of jurors, via surveys of litigants, uh, via surveys and, and also me, uh, uh, of, of judges and lawyers, and also um, uh, looking at outcomes of cases themselves when we randomize them to different conditions. And so that's the research we have going on. And um, I hope that's what you were after, David. Let me turn it back over to you. That is exactly what I was after. And I think uh, even Richard, uh, I think you've given him a lot to think about. And so I'd actually like Richard uh, if you have some reactions to what Jim is doing, and, and not even so much even the conclusions, but 
what should we be looking at? Are these the right questions that we should be investigating in order to figure out whether we're whether we are moving in the right direction in this area? Jim, that was really great on, on a number of levels. I think the first thing to say is methodologically, it's just so important that this work goes on. We have to move beyond anecdote and instinct of lawyers and even without, but with or without consultation with court users to actually getting some serious empirical studies about what's working. Um, and uh, we've done a little bit of this in the UK and you'll see in remote court, courts worldwide, there's more of that. But isn't it in all our minds just now um, in relation to vaccines, I, I think we're all so very conscious of the importance of serious, rigorous, systematic investigation. And I can't tell you how many very respectable judges and lawyers from their own very limited point of view, in a very articulate way, will express a view that is simply not grounded in anything other than their own very limited experience. So the kind of work you're doing is absolutely vital. And it's vital that's done internationally. For the first time ever, in a way, our policy making about the future of courts and justice systems can be evidence-based. Uh, and this I find uh, tremendously exciting, on which incidentally a point that um, not changing your justice system or your court system is as much of a policy choice as changing it. Uh, but there actually isn't much of an evidence base for staying as we are. Th th there may well be a preference psychologically for staying where we are, but we've got to be driven by the kind of research that Jim's undertaking. So the first point is that it's so important that institutions such as Harvard are delivering authoritative research in this area and takes us beyond anecdotes. Second point is, and I just never thought of it, the idea when we're talking about asynchronicity, the idea, and I have to take some time to think about it in more detail, but the idea of recording uh, a criminal hearing and the, as it were, the deliberation of the jury and the observation of the jury taking place at a different time and place is completely fascinating. Again, the initial instinct might be, well, hang on, that's not, that's not a, a jury of the peers operating in the traditional way, but you're, the mindset has to be, why not? Going right back to what you're saying, this should be driven by the values that are important to us, and in my view, the outcomes that are crucial for us, rather than how does it match up to what we've done, as Jeffrey said, for the last 150 years. So that fascinated me, and I'm going to give that a lot more thought. Now, Jim, I'm hoping you, you and I can have a conversation at another stage and link up to some uh, analogous UK research. Thank you. So, Jim, thank you very much. And, and, and Jim is always uh, pushing us to really think rigorously on all sorts of legal questions. Uh, and Jim, you're, of course, welcome to stay and participate, but I'm going to ask Richard something that may also be helpful to, uh, to, to say a little bit more about how you think we can move this community forward and this discussion forward. And, I, and you've mentioned here or there about remote courts worldwide, but maybe if you could say something more specifically about that. And then maybe a few words about what you would like to come out of this discussion where we have had, again, so many uh, important people in so many different places of the world tuning in. Well, thank you. Remote Courts Worldwide was set up in the middle of March as a response to the move internationally from many jurisdictions away from physical courts to remote courts. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, audio courts, video court, audio hearings, video hearings and paper hearings. The, the sense I had was that there was a great movement towards remote courts, but everyone was reinventing the wheel, duplicating efforts. So I thought, how can we at least pool our resources? So it was a joint effort, the Society for Computers and Law, Law Tech UK, British government uh, put money into it, um, Ministry of Justice. And we put together what is essentially a website, the first generation of which invited people to submit news of how they were coping, to submit commentary, to submit their own draft protocols and so forth. Just a forum to which people could go to get a sense of what's happening and to pick up some insights. And in that first wave, we've got 56 different countries represented. Uh, it's quite unstructured as a, in the first wave. So we're just about to start a second wave where it'll be technical improvements, better navigation, uh, better search. But we're also trying to involve the community who've contributed 
in identifying the key issues that remain to be resolved and in having online debate about how we might resolve them. I'm also wanting to extend from what is, I think, 57 countries up towards 100. It'd be great if we've got worldwide coverage. So the idea there is to, as I say, to, to capture current practice and allow people, and I've great feedback from judges, particularly around the world, to say we can just dip in there. It's a reminder again, www.remotecourts.org. You can just dip in there and get a sense of, of, of what's actually happening. So that'll continue, I think, as a, as a useful resource. What occurs to me as I, I listen to the conversation today is there's almost two entirely different communities here. There's a community of clients who are represented and there's a community of clients who are either self-represented or frankly are not even clients at all. They're people with, I think, justiciable issues that never get near the justice system because they don't understand the issues or they wouldn't be able to enforce them. And a lot of our discussion today has been about how lawyers can represent their clients in through remote hearings in the COVID period. And of course, we need to, I think, uh, make sure, as others have said, that we we can stabilize our current ad hoc systems and we can industrialize what's gone well. But my passion in all of this remains, um, well, let me put it a different way. I, I, I think uh, it, it, in many ways we've seen that law firms and judges can look after themselves. Uh, they've been remarkably re resourceful. I, I think if there's an effort required, if there's an intervention, as it were, that we as a global legal community uh, can bring about, it's to helping people who actually have no access to justice. I go back to the OECD figure, less than half the people in our world uh, ha, are, live under the protection of the law. More people, in fact, have access to the internet now, internet now than have access to justice. And I, therefore, am interested in the use of these technologies, not, it's not I'm not interested in law firms using them, but I'm interested in how we might increase access to those who don't have access and how we can help the self-represented. And I hinted the last time, and it's also the last chapter of my book, uh, and I've since been speaking to a number of uh, the big development banks who are similarly interested, whether or not there's some kind of generic global platform, technology platform, that we can put in place that's tailorable for the substance that, uh, of the individual rules of procedure and, and, and laws of individual countries, but enables people to kickstart their move into this virtual world. Very often we get visitors to London who want to see our court system in action and we take them to the wonderful buildings and so forth. But I do say to them, and I think this reflects uh, a view of the development banks, that the opportunities here to, is to leapfrog we as a jurisdiction, although we've got the big buildings, are thinking how we can increase access through remote courts. Why don't you do similarly? But when you think of the technology required, the insight, the experience and so forth, it's very hard to do that from scratch. And it just seems to me to be a glorious duplication of effort if lots of developing countries are doing this. So what the, the charity I'm thinking of setting up uh, supported by various law firms and so forth, uh, and I'd love anyone and uh, anyone listening in to participate too, is to look into the feasibility in the first instance of uh, establishing some kind of generic tailorable platform that would allow developing jurisdictions very quickly to introduce, perhaps it'd be video hearings in the first instance, or it might just be simple diagnostic tools, but we'd put in place this platform that would mean the introduction of this innovation is something that can be done in a modest number of months rather than a formidable number of years. And so my inclination, as I say, is that the law firms uh, will show remarkable adaptability, whether or not it's virtual hearings or paper hearings. Uh, the court systems, and I'm seeing uh, in advanced jurisdictions, uh, judges and policymakers recognizing that there's great benefits to be drawn from these technologies, but the real help is needed is in, in, in frankly, the 54% who don't have access. Well, Richard, I can't actually think of a better uh, way to end this discussion than on that theme. And I, I'll just bring uh, up our continuing interest in this and really uh, at the center, we really are looking in all three ways. Uh, how can we convene thought leaders, but also how can we change the way we're teaching those who are currently becoming lawyers to think about uh, these issues in a way that is as broad 
as you are now suggesting. Uh, but this also ties into another major stream of research we have at the center that's on globalization and emerging economies. And I could not agree more that the last thing we should want emerging economies around the world is simply just to follow uh, whatever it is that we have done in more developed areas, including, uh, you know, the huge costly uh, infrastructure that we have built up, which may or may not be working. And as you said, no one's ever, uh, you know, empirically tested the current system. It's always the burden of proof is on change to have to empirically test that. But the current system itself has never been validated. And uh, we see all over the world the opportunity for emerging economies, whether through mobile banking or entrepreneurship or microfinance or technology or community dispute resolution or a whole range of things to not just recreate, but reinvent what it is that we're trying uh, to do in our justice systems. That is not to say, back to buy something old, something new, something borrowed and not being blue, that there aren't things that are in the old system that are well worth preserving. After all, there's a reason we call it the rule of law and we don't actually want rule of law 2.1 and then there's a glitch and you get a patch and you know that's not the way we think about the rule of law. And actually in our world today, we're seeing the value of predictability, continuity, tradition, uh, access in ways never like never before. But we cannot freeze these things in time. We have to figure out what the values are that we're preserving and then figure out how to use the best of new technologies, the best of new ideas uh, from around the world and from different areas to try to understand how to do what is still critically important, which is to provide the most justice to the most people that we can. Uh, I hope that everybody who has been with us throughout the day or for as much as you uh, have been able to join us will agree that this conversation led by you, Richard, uh, has really uh, opened up tremendous opportunities to think seriously and critically about these issues. I, I wanna give my deepest thanks to everybody who has made this possible and I'm not going to embarrass them by making them turn on their videos, but I'm going to mention by name the terrific team at the Center on the Legal Profession who behind the scenes has made this all work incredibly seamlessly. That's Brian Fong, who's our research and executive director, Tim Shea, who's our lead writer for the practice, uh, my fantastic assistant, uh, Sarah Freeman Aliman, uh, Ralph Madlate, who's our research fellow, all of whom worked tirelessly to assemble this great group of people and to make this conversation everything that it has been. I hope that all of you who are listening will continue to stay in touch with us. Uh, we're going to try to save the comments in the chat and the question and answers so that hopefully we can use this as a springboard for further discussions. We'll be reaching out to you for further events. Uh, we're going to make this uh, uh, webinar available so that even people asynchronously, Richard, so even people who were not able to be with us watching it today will have the benefit of uh, the terrific uh, conversation that you helped us begin. So with that, I will just thank you, Richard. Again, uh, every time we work together, I feel that I, it is such a broadening and enlightening and thrilling experience. Uh, I hope others have felt the same way. Uh, I hope that everyone knows more about your work and the work of all the others who are involved here and everyone will remember the memory of Chief Justice Ralph J. Gantz, uh, whose legacy we honor here with this uh, conversation we've had today. Thank you all very much. And uh, th the program is now over. Thank you. <laughs>